you can have it. Okay, let's start the Nantucket Conservation Commission meeting for April 15, 2015. A couple of reminders, please turn off your cell phones and take any extraneous conversations out into the hall. We are recording this meeting, both audio and visual, and if you record any part of this meeting, you're required to let us know. So with that, we'll go to the public meeting, public comment. Anything from the public on matters that aren't on tonight's agenda? Not okay. a lot of public here. <laughs> Seeing not, we'll go to the public hearing notices of intent. And the following are continued. Um, SBPF Baxter Road, the revetment project. Duke 57 LLC 55 Duke Road. APG DRS Realty Trust, 80 and 84 Wall Winnet Road. Nantucket Harbor Side Condominiums, 80 Washington Street. Great Harbor Yacht Club, 96 Washington Street. And those are all continued to the 29th. What a good idea. And we also have one withdrawal. That's Squam Partners LLC, 89 Squam Road. So if there's anybody here tonight to speak on any of those items that were continued, we can listen to you. Art, yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could just add one continuance um, to your list, if I may, so you have to stop bringing it out. That would be number eight for Saratoga LLC, please, to the next meeting. Okay, so unless I hear an objection, we'll add that to the continuances to the 29th. Anything else? Okay, seeing not. That takes us to number six. Oops, we, who? we do need to actually vote on oh, uh, accept the withdrawal. Okay. Why well, should we do that when we get yes. there? Or uh, no, the withdrawal is number two. So number two. Oh, okay. someone just makes a motion to accept the withdrawal. So moved. Oh. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that motion carries unanimously. <coughs> Okay, now we go to the land bank at 21 Sackage Road, and I have to uh, recuse on this one. All right, so we're opening the hearing for the Nantucket Island Land Bank, uh, 21 Sackage Road, SC 482775. Right. So before Rachel gets up, if you guys have any questions, we continued this last time. This was the project for the kind of the infill of that path mm -hmm. and the little roadway berm. There's some confusion on the form. The box had been checked for uh, natural heritage review, but it's not actually within natural heritage habitat. Um, so we clean that up with DEP. We have a file number. We don't require natural heritage determination or a, a sign-off letter. Um, and that was the only thing we were missing last time. So any I'm sure questions? Rachel would be happy to answer questions. Yeah. Any questions from the commission it? on that maintenance of that path there along Sacagawea? No? Any questions from the audience on that? No? Seeing none? Do we have everything we need to close? Yes. Okay. Do I hear a motion? Move to close. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Okay. That's closed. It's a record. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, the next one's going to be two. Okay. Okay. The next one is the 117 Madicott Road Nominee Trust at 117 Madicott Road. I can get this if you guys want. This is the project that Paul Santos presented last time for the construction of a small studio. It doesn't require any waivers. We are also waiting for natural heritage determination on that. And uh, we received that today. They issued out their uh, no adverse impact, no take letter. Um, so with that, we do have all the information that we need. And you guys didn't ask Paul any questions. So. Paul's not here. And he's not here yet, so. Okay. But. I don't think so. I don't think there's. Well, any. I had instructions to draft a positive. It meets order. all of our. It meets all of our standards. Correct. And doesn't ask for any waivers. Yes, sir. I think that about sums it up. <coughs> so do I have a motion to close the yes, hearing? Yes, you do. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Okay, um, that takes us down to Cronin at 88 Quidnet Road. No file number on this, but no, we'll unfortunately, the last five will not go as smoothly to closure as we first approved it. 
We set a good pace there out of the gate. Yeah. Well, we have, the two we have file numbers for, we have natural heritage issues with. And the three that we don't have file numbers for, we don't have file numbers for. So. <laughs> uh, for the applicant, our guest borrow of Blackmore Associates. I am before you tonight uh, with the notice of intent application that strictly involves the upgrade of a uh, on-site septic system. The uh, property has um, the frontage along the Atlantic Ocean, located out uh, uh, on Quidnet Road. Um, it is sort of a little bit north of the, the village. The um, resource area closest to the proposed work is a coastal dune which is shown uh, as the top <coughs> sign on the plan. The existing septic system is actually within the resource area. The um, proposed system is to um, uh, include a, a septic tech processor, and we would uh, be installing two leach trenches within the 100-foot buffer zone to the coast of Boone. It's actually immediately adjacent to the resource area. The um, reason that we are right up against uh, or located in this particular spot is there's also on-site wells on the, on the property, and we're trying to maintain the 100-foot separation distance to the wells. So I show the wells. And I looked at, well, then, okay, what about the alternative of relocating our wells so that I could get a greater separation distance to the resource area? Okay. However, the neighbor's well uh, to the south, which you can see on the plan, would be hold, hold us the same distance away. And obviously, we don't really have any um, ability to um, uh, relocate their well. So what we're doing is to, like I said, include um, enhanced nutrient removal, and we're increasing the separation distance that exists to uh, seasonal high groundwater. The direction of um, groundwater flow is towards the Atlantic Ocean, so for, we further believe that with the additional nitrogen reduction, um, though there is close proximity to the resource area, that there wouldn't be any adverse impact to, to the resource area, essentially being the, the coastal dune. Um, it's, uh, we, ha we have asked for the waiver on the basis of a long-term net benefit. Also, I think I might have included no reasonable alternative. I think I actually did it on the net benefit. I think you could look at it both ways, though, um, because of the fact that there's simply no other area on the property due to the separation distance to the well. I think this is a try to do the best we can. There's, I'll, I'll come back and say there's no expansion of this system. It's to replace a, a three-bedroom system with a three-bedroom system. And there's currently a cesspool, and we need to put in a separate thing. So um, with that, we have to take questions <coughs> or concerns. Uh, the area would be uh, reseeded afterwards and, um, and just left to be a grass area. Any questions for Art? Is it currently the area where the leach field's going? Is that a lawn or is it beach grass? It, it, it was um, uh, like beach grass in Ragosa. There was brush cutting that was done there <coughs> in order to do the soil testing. Mm -hmm. um, so we would just let that sort of, I, I, I was, what I proposed would be just put seed down and then let it naturally you know, revegetate in that area. We don't really want to have shrub type growth above um, the chambers, small shrubs that might naturally come in, such as native vegetation associated with the dune. I don't see a big problem, but we wouldn't want to be planting anything really more than that in the area. Yeah, that was my worry, was that there was already big stuff there that you had to pull No, out. it was scrubby type stuff, but it was, like I said, this, it was showing the edge of the brush cut there. It was, you know, um, brush cut in order to do the, the soil test investigation. And the cesspools are just going to pump and leave in place, because there's... Uh, yeah, we have a note on here that, um, I see the asterisk going to, to um, I have put it on there. So we have the, the pool. I mean, I, I, I think um, we would just uh, let it, you know, just abandon it. Because you can't really pull it out without making no, it warm enough. No, no, I, I don't think it's worth really, really pulling it out. Any other questions for Art? Anything from the public? Art, I just have one. Concern and I, there's a lot of um, porcelain berry in 
sort of that neck of the woods out there. And if, when you just dis- that disturbed ground, you might I don't know. It's possible you'll see some porcelain berry pop up in there, and you don't want, definitely don't want to get that started in your yard because that stuff just spreads out in those habitats. If you want to include conditions at any you know. Invasive berry that, or you know, that is encountered, so they're smoothed and properly disposed of. I would and say any invasive exotic species, yeah. Air, to have to do it. Yeah, with any invasive. And any invasive species in within these. the work area. Yeah. yeah. Just so that we limit it to that, I don't want to have them going all over the place. Right. Right. right yeah. <coughs> okay. Yeah. If you're okay with that, that's that the W certainly. And like um, um, the administrator mentioned, the DP has an issue to file number, so ultimately. Oh, we will be requesting a continuance <clears throat> for the next meeting. But that's not, it's not in any heritage location. It, no, it's right on the edge. Yeah. National Heritage is mapped here, and this part is taken out, so you have to work right, it's right on the edge of the mapped area. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, if there's any concerns from the commissioner or the public, let's get them on the table now. Not seeing anything. Okay, Art, would you like to continue for two weeks? Yes, please. Okay, unless I hear an objection, we'll continue this to the 29th. Okay, thanks, Art. Yes. Thank you. Okay, Grove Lane Realty Trust, 24 Grove Lane. Unfortunately, I only had time to mark up one plan. <laughs> uh, Brian Madden from LEC Environmental, representing Grove Lane Realty Trust. Uh, proposed project involves raising and of uh, existing single family dwelling and appurtenances. Uh, the wetland boundary is Board of Vegetative Wetland Boundary was approved uh, through a determination of applicability uh, last April. Um, and that boundary more or less follows the edge of lawn. Uh, there's actually some existing lawn areas that uh, <coughs> do encroach into the wetlands. Um, and the proposed project, uh, you can see on that overlay uh, that I passed around. There's existing, under existing conditions, there are 109 square feet of existing structure within the 25 foot buffer zone. Um, the proposed rebuild uh, is, is shifting out further away from the wetland, uh, so there's no, squ- no uh, structure within the 25 foot buffer zone. Um, there is a minimal uh, increase within the 50 foot, and that's entirely within the lawn areas. It's, on the order of 29 square feet. However, um, there is an existing well house um, uh, remnant structure on the far north uh, eastern portion of the site. I'm not quite sure if that was actually included within the calc, so it may be kind of a, a, a net um, neutral impact or n- neutral increase in square footage within the 50 foot. Um, the proposed structure will have four foot uh, crawl space. Um, the bottom of the footing will be uh, just above high ground water. Uh, so we are requesting the waiver for the two feet of separation to high ground water. The structure itself isn't, doesn't excavate into uh, high ground water, so we're not anticipating a need for dewatering. Uh, but if so, um, we will uh, use a dirt bag and, and pump out to areas outside that. Small sliver outside of the 100 foot buffer zone uh, and this portion of the site, the northern portion of the site. Uh, the, the proposed garage will be on slab. Uh, the driveway, pervious driveway, is proposed to be reconfigured. Uh, under existing conditions, 96 square feet of that gravel driveway is within the 25 foot buffer zone. We're taking that all outside of the 25 foot. Um, and what may not be I just want to clarify one thing. It may not be entirely clear on the plans, but um, this area right here is a uh, is a dry laid patio. Um, this is also a dry laid patio. Uh, but underneath this, or over top of this, there's a pergola structure. 
Um, you can see it's kind of shrunken down a little bit so it doesn't match the dry laid patio. That was intended to keep that post outside of the 25 foot buffer zone. Um, and for the proposed minimal increase within the 50 foot buffer zone, uh, we are proposing to revegetate uh, 3,200 square feet of existing lawn areas. Uh, again, a portion of that was within the, the, uh, the wetland boundary itself. Um, and proposed uh, native plantings comprised of red maple, eastern red cedar, sweet pepper bush, inkberry, arrowwood, uh, butterfly weed, joe pie weed, uh, rose mallow, wild iris, and switchgrass. Um, so that basically summarizes the uh, proposed work activity and um, waiver request elements. Turn over to questions. Any questions for Brian? I think he covered it. Uh, that's so the that's dry laid patio, yeah. Okay, so that is within the 25 or proposed within? Correct, yeah. And, um, it's not something we can pull it back further, so it's outside the corner? Yeah, the, the intent was to kind of match that corner, yeah, yeah. Um, just bring it across. Um, I mean, it's, it's existing lawn area right now, mm -hmm. um, so it's lawn versus dry laid patio. Mm -hmm. um, Commission's preference, we can pull that out if need be. But. What's the resource impact difference? I'm not saying that there is any. I was just asking about the drone. Yeah. So if there isn't any, why would we ask anybody to do it? Usually it's a no disturb. Mm -hmm. Zero to 25. Is it existing, changing an existing lawn, which would require some amount of fertilizer? Yeah, it currently is disturbed. Yeah, you well, can argue that it's less disturbed than to have yeah. a patio. Yeah. But it's not like the lawn's going. Right. Yeah, the proposed grade is being lifted up a little bit uh, just to separate from high groundwater. And, and uh, what I didn't say, though, was uh, all roof runoff is being directed from um, gutters to downspouts, and there's a series of storm deck chambers uh, throughout the property. Mm, okay. Yes. And those already exist, or those are going to be added? Those are proposed. I don't think there's any level of mm. treatment. Yeah, the whole thing's moving away from the resource area by quite a... Mm -hmm. what? What's the square foot? In, I'm trying to find out. You mentioned, I'm sorry, I didn't get it, but inside the 50? Yeah, it's... The change in uh, square footage? Yeah, it's, it's, it increases by 29 square feet, oh, okay. but there is that well house in that northeastern corner. Yeah. I'm not quite sure if it was accounted for. No, Under sure. existing conditions, it's... Uh, okay. 1892 and proposes 1921. Mm -hmm. That's pretty close. Yeah, it's being pivoted away. Yeah. yeah. We're not recycling the old structure, right? We're just all new. No, the yeah. grove lane's too narrow, so um, I think we're just doing it. Right. Exactly. I should have said you're not moving the old structure. Yep. This is no, all this new. Is this is all new, right? No. Yeah, and there'd be uh, existing um, town water and sewer. So yeah, you're removing 100 feet, zero to 25, zero, and then going 1890, what is this, 1892 to 1921. Yeah, I, I still know if that was going to happen. Because that's within zero to 15. Yes. It could be. It could be a wash, yeah. But it's not. A, I'm just the point I'm making is it's removing 109 square feet from the zero to 25. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's helpful, but that's not like a thousand square. Feet. I wouldn't call yeah. that taking a lot out of the zero to 25. But I think it's taking some out. Yeah. Right now, um, the closest structure is um, 20 feet. Uh, the deck stairs. Um, so we're moving all all that outside the 25 foot. Anything from the public on Grove Lane? Seeing not.
Oh, uh, that's one of the storm check chambers. Okay, great. Yeah, just to collect some of the So right the off the edge. Yeah. Good, good. There's I can four of them. Four of them. Yeah, one, two. Okay. Well, we don't have a file number on this, so if there's no more questions from anybody. No. Ryan, would you like to continue? Yes, please. For two weeks? Yes, to the 29th. Okay, unless I hear an objection, we'll continue this to the 29th. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So call it, 9 Washington Road. Ready to roll here? We're yeah, just here. we're uh, just sort of reviewing the so, uh, the rules. Uh, I guess borrow Black Home Associates for the applicant. Um, before you tonight with a notice of intent application within the buffer zone to a border and vegetated wetlands. I will start off by letting you know that we are waiting for natural heritage review, so we will be continuing and I'll be able to provide you some provide any revised information or answer any questions that you may have uh, for the next meeting. I would also let you know that I just heard literally j just 15 minutes before the meeting that I, this proposal, uh, while it will be in the same footprint that you see in front of you, uh, will be somewhat revised and I will be providing a revised plan. The, the pr project originally, it's ultimately to provide access down to Washing Pond and originally, and as shown on the plans, it <coughs> includes um, an elevated boardwalk to traverse the area. There has been uh, some discussion in the neighborhood, I guess you could say, and um, I just heard 15 minutes before the applicant from the owner, before the meeting from the owner, that he's willing, uh, given the um, opposition that he's been made aware of, to remove the boardwalk feature and just to make this a path. So um, that we'll be providing a revised plan in the same location that is to um, create a path walking path in order to access the water. Uh, the proposal, I'll give you a little bit of a write-up on it, but essentially would be to brush cut, uh, till, grub that, just, just the area of the path itself and seed it so that you could have a grass path that you would mow going down there, no irrigation, no fertilizer, but to actually have it be a, um, you know, a grass path with, with some, you know, root disturbance would be what, what I would propose not to overly destabilize the area, but so that you could actually, for a, a four-foot area, have something that's smooth that you could run a, a, a mower up and down. And I thought that would be a good point to start with the discussion for you in case I understand with root disturbance and soil that, that there could be some concern if there was some distance back, perhaps, that you wanted to talk about <coughs> doing, you know, from the actual resource area where we maybe wouldn't till put that out sort of for some discussion and some feedback so that I could prepare the revised, you know, our revised plan. But um, we think it would be, I do think it would be reasonable, especially outside of the 25, um, to have that, you know, be created as grass. I think if you just cut what's there, you're going to have a, you know, a little bit harder of an area, maybe not as um, user-friendly, if you would, to, to the applicant. But I would like your feedback on that. And uh, that would be the proposal. Any questions? Um, I guess I'm a little worried about runoff from the actual lawn mm -hmm. wanting to go down this grass path, mm -hmm. like almost giving an access yep. for fertilizer up there to get down to the pond like and water the runoff. The very top of the path. Yeah, to try and stop Upper. it. Because it yeah, because it already seemed like this property was having water okay. issues. I, I agree. So. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like it's a fairly steep little bank right there. Mm -hmm. but much the of that like is actually outside of the buffer, what I would point out to you, because I saw the same thing mm -hmm. and realized, you know, what if he decides to do something a little different out in here mm -hmm. to traverse that? Would I have to revise my plan? The fact is that's actually out of the jurisdiction, though I think it would and then as far as the natural heritage part of for that area, it's all lawn anyway. So realizing the jurisdiction is here. Um that's really that steep part that we really saw uh, is up in here and down in here. It's, the grades aren't nearly as um, 
uh, as drastic. Does that landing still propose? No, we would take away all structural features. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that sounds it's a passing water dependent, but I'm I, I, I understand. And what about, you're going to want to use any fertilizer to get that path established? No. Just a fertilizer. No fertilizer at all. Okay. Mm. I don't want to keep it that way. Yeah. Do you have any photos of, like, the shoreline now, just so we can see if there's damage down there from traffic creating? I can provide them. What is the um, the concept of the green belt strip that runs? That that's part of the subdivision. Yeah. When the subdivision was done, and it's actually, um, uh, you know, it's 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 on each of the certificates of title with uh, a whole list of restrictions, no septics. I mean, not that you could have because yeah. of your regulations, and one of them is no structures. Yeah. Which I think then could have opened up to interpretation whether that means a house or whether this. You know, what was proposed was part of that. I think originally the interpretation was not mine, but uh, that, you know, that wasn't a structure. Right. It's in but anyway, we're, we're, thing we're taking that sort of off the table okay. to mm -hmm. discuss without having it. But that was, um, like I say, when this, uh, when the whole Washington Pond subdivision was done and the divisional lots that was created and, and um, except it imposed really on each of the, of the lots. But I'm assuming the kayak storage won't happen on the path. Right. Right. Okay. Anything from the public on Pollock? <laughs> See nothing. So, any final questions from the commission or comments? Okay, Art, we'd and like to continue two weeks. Okay, and must have heard your revised plan in time for the line. And some photos. And some photos, yes. I'm assuming that the kind of jogging is to match what's currently, but that's great to get to the point. I think so, but I'll look at it. Yeah. Okay, I must have heard an objection. We'll continue this to the 29th. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Art. Okay. Five Quays LLC at Five Quays Pasture Road. We have file numbers for next nope. Oh, they, we do have a file number. Yeah, we do have file numbers. We don't have heritage. We don't have heritage. Oh. So the next two were in file numbers are good. National heritage is bad. Can I quote you on that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Just, 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 just a statement as, as stated. <laughs> no. No, please don't. No. <laughs> it's on video if they want to see it. Just don't take it out of context. Good afternoon. Mark Ritz from Site Design, uh, representing the applicants at Five Quays Pasture. Uh, this is a property that the commission has seen within the last couple of years that it was an existing house that was removed and the approval was granted for a new structure, which is shown on the plans. Uh, what I am here with this evening is a proposal to uh, make some uh, well, to bring the, an existing footpath into compliance, we have a path that extends from the lawn area uh, across three BVWs to a little upland knoll here and then grants access to, to the water. Uh, what the applicant is proposing to do is to span the wetland portions of the existing path with uh, an elevated fiber grade walkway. Uh, it will be installed on 4x4 four four wooden posts. The walkways, uh, the segments of walkway will start just on the upland side of, and end on the upland side of each wetland. And the sections in between will just be the existing uh, footpath that is there now. At the water end of this, there will be a small wooden platform and a set of removable steps that will probably be something on the order of six or seven steps to get down to, to uh, the little beach slash 
near marsh area there. What, it, it seems to vary with the time. <laughs> what is actually present on that shoreline? And those steps will be removed in the uh, in the winter and stored up on the platform. That's pretty much the extent of the project uh, in front of you this evening. So I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Yeah, there, there are a lot of trees in the area. We're avoiding, you know, taking any down or anything. The path kind of winds around, but it's it's been there. Uh, the old house that was there was a was a fairly old structure, and this path has been there for. Uh, I, I think it was showing up. The earliest I saw it was, I think, or photos from the early 70s. Um, quite likely before that. There are, there are paths on all of the you know, adjacent properties as well. And what we're really looking to do, you know, the, the performance standard locally says that a path must be via elevated walkway and we're just trying to bring it into compliance with the standard and not have to traipse through the, the marsh. Because you know what happens when you, when, uh, through the wetland, excuse me. You know what happens when, you, when people do that, they end up dropping boards and other mm -hmm. debris. So we, we felt that a fiber grade elevated would be preferential here. On the site walk, we saw several of the boards and <laughs> such that were, mm -hmm. that were there. Yeah, it's a, it's a three foot wide section, really minimal width path, just just a walking path. But how high? Uh, it'll vary, kind of you know, twelve to eighteen inches. The the vegetation that's there mm -hmm. is sporadic at best. There isn't really a, a very well established vegetation community. It's mostly kind of mucky mud, and you know seasonal leafy stuff grows up in there and then dies back. Uh, we were walking, you know, there was a little bit of, of stuff coming up through the mud, but there wasn't like a, a, a classic wetland plant community this high there when, when we, for most of it. Now, is that just in the path or is that the whole wetland? That That's kind of in, in, you know, pretty consistent throughout these these swaths of wetland which are perpendicular to the property. Mm. It's a little, a little more as you go further off to the sides, but the the general area, you know, within probably 10 or 15 feet of the path was was pretty minimal vegetation when we were out there. I thought it seemed pretty standard for this time of year. The mosses, sort of. no ferns have come up. Well, the nice thing yeah. about yeah. the fiber grade, if you're using the big enough openings, is it lets more mm -hmm. right those. Mm -hmm. It's much better than the wood. The wood slat one. More durable too. Yeah. yeah. Don't need to be worked on as often. Yeah, we thought this was pretty much the lowest impact that we could do to, you know, let light through and, and you know, three foot wide path is really, you know, we don't want it too high so we don't have to deal with railings and stuff, mm -hmm. but we wanted to let enough space underneath. I believe the standard is usually about 18 inches, but. It depends on the marshes as well. Yeah, but it, it's not it's not it's not salt marsh though. It's Jeff, what's the um, permitting history? Is there any issues left over on this property? No, it's actually pretty good. We just did that permit in the last year for the removal of that structure, but they haven't had any other mm. outstanding issues or enforcements or anything that's kind of lingering around on it. It's actually a good. nice, good, clean permitting shape. So did you get notice any, I mean, it's not a good time here to see rare plants, but anything out there. Thinking kind of in the upland, this is a classic area for um, St. Andrew's Cross. I can see St. Andrew's Cross, I mean, I mean it's all um, fescue, and the, the forest was uh, swamp white oak mostly, some ferns, they just hadn't popped, um, too below in the winter, you know, but it was, Pretty clean, really. Okay. Like, like this is all going to be hand installed. Yeah, yeah. You know, everything will be cut outside of the buffer, hand carried in. You know, they're just you know, four by four posts. They're just going to dig the holes, pop them in. You know, minimal, no, no heavy equipment, just hand tools. Anything from the public on the five quays nominee trust?
seeing nothing. Anything else from the commission then? That steps and ends can be removed seasonally or? Yes. Yes, just the seasonal steps that will be pulled up and stored out of there. Um, we're just, we're just going to have a small landing up there. It doesn't make sense to go around there. It gets very wet here. There's already a path here on this little upland. Um, it get and it's it's very it starts to get in more into salt marsh in this area. So we just figured let's use the existing path. You know we're we're really we're following the existing path. We're not deviating from it at all. It's one of those old Nantucket paths where it just boards and scrap wood that's been thrown mm -hmm. over yeah. stuff for years and years. Spots that get really squishy. Mm -hmm. So we're waiting to hear from Heritage on this one, are we? Okay. Yeah, I'd like to continue to the 29th. If, uh, I, I guess it, if it's something that, if no one has any questions on it, we can draft an order for this for next time. Before could, yeah. Yeah. I kind of put that down for the last yeah. yeah. So unless I hear an objection from the commission, we'll continue this to the 29th. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Okay, Pulpus Harbor LLC, 250 Pulpus Road. Again, Mark Ritz from Site Design, representing the applicants of 250 Pulpus. Now, this is a slightly more complicated <laughs> project, a little more going on than, than what I just presented. Um, the site is currently developed. There's a house, several additional buildings, a pool, a septic, a lot of landscaping, uh, a rather old boathouse on the water side and a path going out to, to the small boathouse. What the applicant is proposing to do is to, we'll start with the easy things. Uh, first thing they're going to do is renovate the existing structure, uh, not much change to it, uh, just kind of exterior renovation. The only change is an additional uh, porch on the water side outside of the 50-foot buffer to the BVW. Um, they're also going to renovate two existing structures on site. They're going to remove the existing pool and replace it with a different pool. That will be outside of the 50. Uh, they're going to upgrade the septic system outside of 100, just squeezing it into the very small part of the property that's outside of the 100. Uh, there's an existing driveway which comes in on the west side, it's located partially within the 25 to the BVW pervious driveway. They're going to relocate that outside of the 25. Now for the uh, slightly more complicated stuff, existing boathouse uh, is located partially within the BVW. They're going to jack it up in place using basically bottle jacks. They're not going to bring in any heavy equipment. Replace the old crumbly piers that are under it with new ones no other changes to the structure. They want to run uh, an electrical line out to it along the existing path, but no uh, changes in footprint to the structure. All the work is going to be done with, with you know, basically with hand jacks. They're not going to roll any equipment down there. The rest of the work on the site includes the construction of a secondary dwelling on the east side outside of the 50-foot buffer. On, on this side, we, we get a little more complicated with resources. We've got a BVW, and we also have along the uh, western property line, we have a small section of shore perpendicular uh, policy 92-1 coastal bank. It's, uh, this was a, a detailed topo exercise out there that revealed a bank based on that, on that slope definition. It runs from approximately here around the west side, uh, starts about here and runs around the west side. It's likely that it was, you know, it's well vegetated now. We didn't go digging in there, but either way, it's, it's a bank um, based on that policy 92-1. So 
the, the house, pool, patio that are proposed here, secondary dwelling, is located outside of the 50-foot buffer to both the BVW and that uh, policy bank. We've got a secondary pervious driveway coming in here outside of the 25-foot buffer to any resources. We've got uh, a septic reserve field outside of the 100. And we've also got a, uh, a pervious tennis court that we're proposing. The tennis court is located here, south of the secondary dwelling. The tennis court is entirely outside of the 50-foot buffer to the BBW. A small corner of the tennis court fence, uh, approximately 300 square feet, is inside the 50-foot buffer to the policy bank uh, on, on this uh, northwest corner of, of the fence around the court. We're requesting a waiver for that, and what we're proposing to do as a site enhancement to, to provide a net benefit on the site is to replant a large section, approximately 3,000 square feet of the 25-foot buffer on the other side of the property. Yeah. Uh, additionally, a couple things that came up when we were out at the site on the site walk, there are some areas uh, where there ha had been some previous vista pruning and other work mm -hmm. done by the previous property owner I think there was a fairly good consensus that it looked like most of the cutting was on the order of, you know, one to three years old on site because there was new growth coming up. Uh, what the applicant is proposing to do in, in those areas is to just leave things alone and let them, let them revegetate. There was also one additional area with some fairly significant cutting here next to the driveway into the wetland and there is some sort of perforated drainage pipe there. Um, we are proposing to remove that pipe and to replant, as part of our enhancement here, we'll replant the area that was, that was cut into the wetland. Since we're continuing this one till next week, we're gonna work with, with Mr. Madden back there to come up with a species list and planting plan for restoring the area and for enhancing the buffer. There are also two drains coming off of the uh, side of the existing house and draining into the wetland. Those have been there, we don't know how long. Uh, one uh, we tracked down is from the downspouts and one is a sump pump. We are proposing to reroute those drains to some infiltration that we will put somewhere outside of the, of the 50 in the, in the driveway and lawn. So we will deal with those, get them rerouted away from from draining directly into the wetland. Um, and that, I think, is most of, most of the issues I can remember at this time, but I will be happy to <laughs> address anything the commission has for me. Any questions? Hmm. Is the area you're revegetating the same area that was going to be reestablished on previous NOIs? Do you know? I do not believe so because this area had been, uh, this area does not look like it's had any recent cutting. It's, it's all old established lawn with the exception of one area that was pretty clearly, they went beyond the lawn and did kind of a semicircle cut of probably about 30 25 to 30 feet in for, I don't know what the reason was. Uh, many of the other areas that, that were cut that needed to be reestablished, I believe there was a lot of area along the side of the path where the lawn ends and then you've got maybe six to 10 feet of what looked like it had been cleared and it's starting to come back and you know we're proposing to leave that. There was also some cutting in here of some more significant stuff and again, things are starting to, to come back in there and we're proposing to not go in there and do anything and just let it come back. Um, a lot of these issues are, are from the, you know, from previous owners and work on the site and we're kind of happy to, to let things revegetate where they're supposed to. We don't want to expand lawn areas or anything like that. Um, 
but we feel that at the vast majority, if not all, of our proposed uh, 3,000 square feet of buffer enhancement is area that, that has been historically lawn area. And then, you know, in addition to uh, site viewing, we saw that area that had been cut. We'll restore that, obviously, because that was, that was damaged. But that's kind of outside of the area. Uh, we were proposing, really, to replant up to the house, and that area goes uh, beyond the extent of the current, you know, where the house is. Can we hear? I'm sorry, one of the things in our consultant's report on um, page 289 um, was con some um, confusing wetland flies, um, three different colors, and, and then they also mentioned two culverts stacked up under the path to the structure by the harbor, uh, which can make things interesting resource-wise, but I was just asking Jeff if that's been addressed or... I believe that it has been. Um, I know we've we've gone out there on our sidewalk, and I actually spoke with Bruce about this this morning, mm -hmm. about going through and figuring it out. Some of them are very old flags. Some of them are newer. Um, LEC's flags are pretty clear. The other ones are all labeled LEC. You mm -hmm. can kind of track them around. The two culverts that are in the path um, are a little bit different for what's there. We're trying to figure out through the old orders when those went in, but fortunately we have two weeks to try to figure that out. So we'll hopefully have that resolved. That's on the list of things with the other discharge pipes that Mark has been trying to track down and figure out where they're all going uh, about how we, went, how we want to handle those and if that's actually providing a consistent connection between wetland resource to wetland resource, how we're going to, to treat that. But I think that's all stuff after getting the report a little bit late to the meeting and then all of these things coming together. Um, I know Mark had expressed kind of an interest in trying to address all of those issues in some sort of kind of revised narrative and, for lack of better terms, kind of a, a vegetation management scheme and plan for the property. That's what I was almost going to think we needed an overlay. Yeah, I, I, I think that's something that, given kind of the history of what's there um, and with the ownership change, I think this is a really good opportunity for the commission to really establish the expectations for vegetation management on this property going forward with someone that's new. Uh, some of it's just going to be allowing them some degree to put together, we want to leave it, we want to do this, and then if we feel that it's not sufficient in doing the order, we can certainly add to or supplement what's there. Mm -hmm. um, but the means easy to fix. It's correct. They know, but if it's so complicated, I do think it an overlay Yeah, and, and, and violations, because most of these are... And some of the things we've, we've been talking about with these two include some way of, you know, permanently marking areas that aren't to be cut somehow, whether it's with, you know, with fencing or some sort of marker that's there so when people are out on the site they know. Or even for the first part, since we're going to be doing some vegetation restoration here on the site, if it gains a positive permit, that you can include monitoring for other spots in the area. We say we need to have those reports come in for the whole lot so we can be, you know, sure for the next three to four years that we're not seeing any vista cutting or we're not seeing any of those things. So you can get all of those things coming forward, and I think this is a good opportunity to do that. Some of this is going to be a little bit of discovery. I mean, it's not every day we find pipes that are painted brown and hidden in the mud. So we'll uh, <laughs> slowly but surely start crossing stuff off. So, okay. um, And we haven't been able to find what that actually drains. It doesn't. All of the downspouts on that side are, you know, they just open up onto the ground. They're not infiltrating anywhere. So we can't make heads or tails of it. So we're just perfectly happy to make it go away. <laughs> and the, the thing, it, this is, sorry, I forgot, I got off track. The, the pipes that go through the path on the way to the boathouse, too, is they may be connecting kind of those two sandwiching resource areas that are through there. So there may be ways to address that or look at some sort of enhancement for there to that boathouse. Um, the one thing that's with that path is that's why we're trying to figure out when those things went in, when those activities went on, because that path has been established for a very long time to that boathouse. So we will get it resolved. I'm not sure if that is some sort of intermittent thing that connects the two, 
how that would really affect <coughs> the buffer zones for the project, especially in relation to the boathouse, mm -hmm. since the, it's pretty much in the resource area mm -hmm. where it sits. So, um, to we'll figure it out, though. He was just curious what the soil information was. I know he had noted that it was kind of a depressional area on the site. Um, for, for the this is the reserve, and then the primary is primary is up here on, on very high ground. Correct. So if it, where the existing is, basically. If you've been on the site, the area that's the proposed tennis court, mm -hmm. uh, more if you drive by, is significantly lower and set in off of Pulpus Road. Okay. So I think he had some concern if that area was taking a lot of heavy drainage, if it had started to set up any sort of hydric soil or provided some sort of saturation. I think that's what that, that what concern came from. The new pool is here and there's another one in the deck here. The tennis court is here, which is about where... Yes, yeah, so the tennis court is yeah, yeah, there's there's that test pit there. Okay. The other thing about this site is it's, you know, in a very sensitive part of the harbor up there in the Pulpus Harbor area. So uh, as far as lawn management, this would be a good site to start implementing some of those recommendations from the last um, fertilizer um, meeting, you know, as far as actually starting to test some of these areas to make sure that no additional nutrients are being added beyond what is actually needed for the yard, not just the standard, well, two pounds of, you know, whatever, nitrogen, and, but to actually start to look at the vegetation, look at the soil, and see if that much is actually needed. Yeah. Well, it's a bit soil of a test for any phosphate. Yeah, correct. plus phosphate, yeah. We can address that in, in our overall planting restoration plan because a, as of right now we haven't proposed the use of any any fertilizer in, in buffer in buffer zones. Um, so. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves with applying a standard that we don't have either. We, we, we do have well, a, an existing yeah, standard yeah. and there has been a, so there has been a, a session that was put on by a uh, political activist group, and uh, they presented certain viewpoints. And yeah, this is the, yeah, this is the BMP. So and, they were. and we've accepted them. They're accepted the commission. Cur currently, the BMP doesn't provide a uh, more stringent regulations for no, areas that not yet we're working on. No, so I'm just saying let's just keep ourselves in. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Well, I'm just saying that they're looking for ways to um, justify, waiver. justify waivers. Yeah. Well, I guess I would say not to – is if they're going to be putting together some sort of vegetation management component as part of dealing with some of the cutting and stuff before, I think one of those components would obviously include irrigation and fertilizer use and other – ways they're going to establish vegetation, that if mm -hmm. that comes forward and we need to impose conditions upon what that is, whether it's monitoring or reporting or mm -hmm. changing the use a little bit, if it meets our standards, I think that would be the the best time to address those would be when they actually, mm -hmm. okay. if they come forward and say we're not going to be using any fertilizers or using any irrigation, mm -hmm. that simply becomes part of their protocol to do it. So then they're not, even without the condition, not able to do it. So. That may be the path that they are choosing to go down. I'll have to check what the status of current irrigation is because I'm not. I'm. Sh I believe there are a lot of areas that don't have any, um, from what I've seen out there. But I can, you know, we will we'll address that as, as Jeff mentioned in in our in our plan that we'll give you guys before the next meeting. Okay. Anything from the public? Yes, Mr. Reed. Uh, the record are Ethel Reed representing George and Ann Tom who live across the street at 253 Focus Road. We don't have any objection to uh, any aspect of the NOI that uh, uh, involves no waivers. And as far as the projects, portions of the project that require waivers, we don't have any objection to the alterations to the uh, existing structures that are partially located within the uh, 
um, uh, within the 50 foot, including the boathouse and the uh, 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 and the existing main dwelling. Um, I would urge you not to grant any uh, waiver for new construction, however, uh, which I believe, uh, as I follow the presentation, is only with regard to the uh, coastal bank as it affects the uh, proposed uh, tennis court. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we would we would ask that you not uh, 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 allow that waiver, uh, and uh, that uh, as far as new construction is concerned, which is which which that would be, uh, but I don't believe uh, that it would be appropriate to do it. There's, there's no uh, they have plenty of uses on the site. In fact, a fairly ambitious project, and I. Uh, applaud their uh, creativity in being able to get so much out of the site <laughs> outside the very extensive uh, resource areas. Uh, but I do think that uh, 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 it's a stretch to say that they have no reasonable alternative with regard to um, that aspect of, of the proposal since they have so much that they can already do on the site, uh, including the new and large uh, swimming pool that they propose. And, <laughs> and the second swimming pool will get closed in another location. Uh, well, that, that's that's our only uh, point again. Uh, the uh, resource impact on on allowing that waiver would be. Uh, I I'm not at this point prepared to argue that point. You have the uh, 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 you have the performance standards for a reason, and we're suggesting that you uh, follow them. Apologize for being a little bit late, Kevin Dale for the applicant, Pocus Harbor LLC, with respect to the waiver request in the tennis court, uh, this may be redundant, but I just, I know that you will consider the arguments and the facts and uh, evidence we put forward to justify the waiver before you make a decision without simply saying no to it at this stage. So uh, we'll make our case, and if Mr. E wants to object, he can. Thank you. Anything else from the public? Yeah, Ms. McKinnon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Emily McKinnon for the Nantucket Land Council. Just to briefly add to the discussion on fertilizers, it just occurred to me that uh, not too long ago, I think there was an applicant just down the road on Pulpus Road with a property that also abutted Pulpus Harbor that was doing some redevelopment. And as part of their waiver request, they suggested not using fertilizers within at all within the 50 foot buffer zone. And just to throw that out there, as this project moves along, I think that would also be, at a minimum, very appropriate for this lot with this amount of lawn adjacent to Colpus Harbor. And then I would also just add that regardless of what the BMP regulations actually are, you as a commission absolutely have every right to consider additional restrictions on fertilizer use within your jurisdiction of 100 feet. And um, especially in sensitive areas like this, I would absolutely recommend that you do so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. So the whole point in this um, uh, having these educational opportunities and having all that we've done on fertilizer management is that we be sure that what we're doing with the use of fertilizer products or what we're allowing to be done is done in such a way that does not contribute to uh, leaching, particularly nitrates in the saltwater areas, uh, has been the focus in the beginning anyhow, and we're now moving into phosphates in the freshwater. Sorry, I digress, but, but to limit the, uh, to apply and use the product in such a way that the measured and published science has shown us again and 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 again does not contribute nitrates leaching uh, into the groundwater. And if we can, if we can uh, do that by following certain standards, then we've accomplished what we need to do in terms of protecting the resources. And to, uh, to uh, use the, well, our authority and the police power of the government to limit what people can do on their property when uh, what they're proposing to do is not uh, likely to contribute to any uh, resource degradation is an abuse of our authority. Um, 
I guess I've just done enough studies on non-point source pollution, which includes fertilizers and their impacts on bays and estuaries all up and down the East Coast and in Florida, and it actually is really important for the resource areas to make sure that we follow these standards. Yeah, absolutely, to follow the standards. Right. And, and, and what happens when we, when, we, when we do those studies and we go back, we can go back to 1997 was a pivotal year here, 2001, we can go back into the 80s and what studies have been presented locally and referenced what the measured and published data shows and when asked how to, when asked how to reconcile the things that have been published in the newspapers and the, and the scare me stuff with the, with the science, the answer from the guys who were doing the studies locally was no, not going to answer that. And that's caused us to back way up and all that business about Article 68 and to delve back into things. And, I, and, I, and, and in my view, the important thing is that we continue to base the decisions on the facts and on the science and that we not get into fear mongering. And I think sometimes that we so do that. I guess in this case, would you be saying then that we should require soil testing in all these areas so that we have the baseline science to say what they can apply? What I'm, uh, I don't think we want to reinvent the wheel in every property. What I'm saying is that uh, as far as I can, what, I, what I'm saying right now is that it seems to me we should follow the uh, well-vetted standards that have come out of the Article 68 and the BMP, and that if we want to go, if we want to go further with that, that we slow it down a little bit and discuss that through and come up with uh, what we need to do, but not just to assume we need to. Uh, you'll all remember again and again these proposals to ban, prohibit, etc., and that just that we not assume that we need to do that. That we kind of take a moment and and make sure we know why we're doing what we're doing. Okay, I think this is definitely we're going into something that's a much larger discussion here, with you know larger ramifications in this particular. Well, I think probably you're right, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, as one of the guys that does water quality testing in the harbor and in the groundwater and in Polkas Harbor, both for the state and in collaboration with the Natural Resource Department and with the Land Council for 10 years and a PhD in chemical oceanography, in case anyone has not remembered that, there is clear evidence of both increases in nitrate and even localized phosphate in both the harbor and in Polkas Harbor throughout the year, episodically, throughout each season and after rainfall. So we have evidence that's presented every year, that's in their office, that's in the state's office. Oh, that nitrates, shows that nitrates in the harbor. Both in, yeah, yeah. increased nitrogen. Yeah. We've got three types of evidence, too. We've got the lingvia that's showing up, the rust tide, the coccidinium, the restriction, the eelgrass is, is pulling away from the edges. So we've got both chemical uh, evidence and we've got biological evidence. We've got uh, changes in nitrate in the tidal area right around the boat base, and these are all well documented. So yeah, all of which is a reason why you want to be sure that if you're using a product that contains that, that you're using it in such a way that it does, is not going to contribute. Right. I think yeah. the real question here is is the BMP good enough good to enough protect these sensitive areas? And that, you know, we haven't seen the BMP go into real effect yet and we haven't seen the net benefit from it. So if, if a site like this adopts and follows the BMP, I think it's going to be a huge improvement on the site. So I think that's really the question that we have to look going forward. Is the BMP good enough to protect the more sensitive areas? Well, and we did in, in, adopt the whole BMP into a regulation. That's correct. Yeah. So that's the, that's everything in the BMP as of right now is, is adopted and, and something we should adhere to. Not, not to broker the peace today, but I think this is something, if we want to have this discussion, not to be on 250 Pulpus Road about right. our questions mm -hmm. about the BFP and fertilizer. If it's something that we want to, we can simply add a discussion on the implementation of the BMP on our, you know, within our jurisdiction. We I can, agree with all. We can have that a discussion and have people that are far more knowledgeable than it just seemed to me we're getting a little ahead of ourselves yeah, on, on yeah, this particular yeah. one we can, here. Yeah. We can certainly set that up. I know we've been talking about doing another workshop on invasive species, maybe something that we can just schedule a, a meeting to talk about those two separate issues outside of having to hear applications that we could do and then 
poor Kevin, Arthur, and Mark don't have to stand here while we argue about fertilizers <laughs> for 45 minutes. So, if I may, very briefly, we, um, you know, obviously we respect the concerns uh, associated with fertilizers, but as of this time, we're not proposing the use of any, right. and we're going to come in with uh, a planting plan. And if we do propose the use of fertilizers, we're going to try to obviously keep them in compliance with the standards, and we can discuss them appropriately then. But as of right now, we're not asking for any. So, you know, let's, let's keep that in mind. We'll see what we come back with after we put together a plan with Brian and, and so forth. But as of right now, we're not asking for any. Okay. Anything else from the public or the commission besides fertilizer? <laughs> I had a quick question about the court surface. Uh, we talked about uh, on Monday. I can't remember exactly what. Uh, currently, sure. as, as far as I'm aware, it's, it's supposed to be a clay court. It's supposed to be a not, clay court. Not asphalt. Now, is there any chance that they could, I know that the fence is, is in lines or anywhere, they could uh, maybe bring the grass inside the fence line a little mm -hmm. bit in those corners instead of doing a full clay court right out to the fence? I so will, just the fences in the... I will speak to the powers that be that know things about tennis courts because my, my experience with tennis ended, I think, when I was about nine. And it's so about the same here. I will, I will inquire. That, that is something, actually, that we've, we've put out there as a question and are waiting back for an answer uh, because we, we had the same thought, I think, that you're having right Yeah, now. and then we're just dealing with the fence. But we will address that for the next hearing as well. Okay, if there's nothing else from the commission or the public, do we need to we need to continue this, Chris? Yes. We yeah. ask for continuance to the next That's hearing, please. Okay, unless I hear an objection, we'll continue this to the 29th. Okay, thanks, Mark. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to the public meeting request for determination. Right, at 40 Pocono Road and Madawi Creek Road. <laughs> Jeff, did we hear anything from our consultants on this? Um, we just got some new information from Oxbow um, in the packet that's there where they did some discussion um, and they provided the DEP forms. Um, I know they've received it, but receiving it on the 10th to now, but they haven't provided an actual formal report. They've also, you know, previously worked on some of them, but I think it'd be helpful just to hear kind of a summary of the new information submitted. Mr. Chairman, I uh, have a thought. I wonder if I might just before we begin the presentations on this. Is I, I, and I want to say this with respect for all the professional advocates that are in the room, what I understand. The people are hired to advocate for the clients, and and um, I'm struck by this, and I've done quite a bit of uh, reading since our last uh, our meeting here. I've gone back and just read the text of the bylaw. I've read the Town of Nantucket Committee guidelines. I've re-read re, uh, the applicable parts of the DEP um, standards, and I've looked uh, particularly under what it says uh, on the Town of Nantucket Committee guidelines, and it re refers to conducting our uh, meetings according to Roberts, and you'll all be happy to know I didn't bring my Roberts with me this afternoon. It's not my intention to really sort of dig into that uh, today. Um, but the, the gist of what I got and what, uh, what I think uh, is that in the commission sense, I don't want to get ahead of myself again in that respect, but it, I mean, it seems to me that what well, that what's, uh, the, what's in front of us on this request is really a private matter and has little to do with the public interests as expressed in either one of the laws. And uh, where the original determination and the uh, resource area boundaries is currently under appeal, uh, unless that's, I don't, I assume it's still under appeal. I don't know if that's changed at all. So. Uh, that's still within our reach in terms of getting into that to settle it and so forth. And according to my understanding then of Roberts is this is basically asking us uh, as a matter of a private matter and you can see when you get the largest scale 
uh, drawing about getting close to somebody's pool and tennis court with a new house, that this is really um, misusing our process in furthering the public interest in, is improperly before us is my own view. And I just want to toss that out and see if, uh, if any of the other commissioners have similar thoughts or if I'm the only one who sees it that way at this point. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would agree the whole thing seems a little fishy to me. I, I yeah, understand that, you know, Oxbow is far more than capable. Probably some of the best in the business. Well, I don't know. Um, it's still a matter of wetland delineation, delineation, which is our purview. And right. whatever their reasons for contesting it, if it's a wetland delineation issue and they've got, you know, evidence to support that, I don't care if it's because their grandpa didn't like where that wetland was, you know? I mean, that's their, their gig, you know? Yeah, the motivation really doesn't. I mean, it's basically, a, you know, and they've presented us a lot of evidence on both sides. I think this is a really complicated one. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so and everybody had the opportunity to participate in the original hearing that's under appeal now as well, and this is... I mean, this is just so clearly a private and not a public. I would challenge anybody to to articulate a public interest I will. that is at stake here. I'm you won't, I will. <laughs> I may be heard. Okay, go Mr. Ahead. Glackey's done. I mean, we know his view. I'm Kevin Dale. I represent the applicants, Bob and Suzanne Wright. We were here last time on April 1st to look at the facts and the site information to determine the wetlands delineations. Contrary to what Mr. Glavacki said, this is not a private matter. It's a public matter. The rights have the right as citizens of this country to ask this board that's charged to determine where wetland delineations are. They have the right to ask for that. So I object to any suggestion that this is improper. Uh, I decline to have that put forward. It prejudices the hearing, and I reject it. What's important to get to, to, get to the point, last time the commission asked for additional information to determine whether or not a certain wetland delineation and flags made by Oxbow Associates, Mr. Butler who's here, Brian Butler, is supported by soils and plantings in the field. Mr. Butler went out to the site and has determined that they are in fact, it's incontrovertible that his flags show a wetland. And he will speak to that. The other concern that I have is there was a consensus at last meeting among all of the parties that this area includes isolated land subject to flooding. That's been agreed to. We asked for permission to go on to the 40 Pacamo a lot to uh, conduct a topographical survey, which is the only reliable protocol and procedure to determine boundaries of an isolated land subject to flooding under the DEP standards and your standards. The owner declined to let us do that. I was told by his counsel that the owner, owner's wetland expert, Mr. Haynes, would make that determination, would go on the property, would determine the boundaries of the isolated land subject to flooding. I don't believe there isn't any new topographical survey information at this point to make that case as to where the boundaries are. And thirdly, we all know it's springtime and there's clear evidence, and Mr. Butler will speak to it, Mr. Gasparo too, that um, there are factors and uh, flora or fauna out there that indicate there's a vernal pool. I'm not an expert, but I want to have Mr. Butler address that. So we'd like the opportunity as the applicant, as the advocate for the applicant, to make our case as to why the Oxbow Associates wetlands flaggings should be accepted and should be used to determine the wetland resource areas on this particular property. 
I'll be happy to answer your questions, but I defer to Mr. Butler so he can be specific. You are going to explain to us how this is in the public interest? It is in the public interest because any citizen of the United States has the right for any reason whatsoever to ask this commission to determine the wetland resource areas on his or her property. That is a right. And it doesn't need to have a reason. It could be done for nothing. It could be done for a reason. It could be done for uh, many things. But the question, the motivations of citizens who come before a public board and to suggest before the hearing even opens that what they're doing is improper, I reject that out of hand. You know, usually I agree with that, too. Well, good. Getting you should agree with motives. this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't and, think we... I don't think the rest of the board has a I understand. issue with um, But I think that the, the preamble here is uh, unacceptable, unfortunate, and colors things. I think it's uh, something that we want to stick with, the facts, the law, the site situation, and the evidence here, and not go into anybody's motivations, whether they be members of the commission or applicants. Chairman, if I may, the it seems to me that if the determination, accurate determination, of the boundaries of wetland resource areas is not in the public interest, I can't think of any reason for this commission to exist. Exactly. I think it's essential to what you're doing. And to add to that, if I could, Mr. Chairman, um, this was not previously filed. There was a permit issue that was not previously filed with the DEP, but in the interim, we've, I think, determined or agreed that there is a, re a state resource area here, minimally ILSF, um, which extends at least partly onto the way, which is partly uh, fee ownership is partly with the rights. Um, and filling, altering that resource area is a public interest. If, if you fill it, you're going to displace that flood storage onto somebody else's property, and one of the owners is the rights, uh, or two of the abutting properties are, are the rights, and there's other public members of the public that have, uh, could suffer injury from improper displacement and flood storage. So if, you really, if you want to boil it down to that, I, I think that's specific to this case. Yeah. Well, that was the point I was going to make, is this is jointly owned, that where, where it's moving out into, if we accept that, is actually jointly owned into this easement, into this way, which has got ownership with both <coughs> the NCF, with the applicants, right. and with the rights. Fee ownership. Fee ownership. Right. So it's multiple. It's a... It pushes it on to, in, in a way, into another and, and portion. And Nantucket Conservation Foundation, which I represent, mm -hmm. uh, which is the majority owner of, of that land, the land in the way and the land behind, uh, s supports the rights actions in, in this matter. It's important to know. <clears throat> if it's the right time, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to do a, a brief presentation just to, in support of the materials we submitted since the last, uh, unless there's other issues that you wish to... Pursue uh, first. I think we're ready to go with that. <clears throat> um, since the last meeting here, we submitted uh, to this commission a package of materials, um, partly partly in response to the discussion of the April first hearing, I guess it was. Um, and specifically, we provided DEP uh, data sheets for the locus in question, these four wetland flags, and we also examined the. Um, the data sheet that Mr. Haynes had prepared. And in the package that we provided you, I, uh, in red, I redlined the uh, submitted data sheet from March 25th from Mr. Haynes that, uh, in which he misidentified the uh, prior species as Glauca, which is an upland species, and it's actually, in fact, rotundifolia, which if any of you are amateur botanists or um, want to spend any time, that's taken from the site, directly from the site within the wetland boundary flags. There's no actual Glauca, uh, the upland version of that, uh, the briar, cat briar, or there's a number of colloquial names uh, for both species of briar. <clears throat> They're used somewhat interchangeably, but green briar, rotundifolia, is a fact plant that's most pervasive on most parts of the island, at least in my experience. Um, and it's, it is a true, up, the other, the Glauca is an upland plant. It doesn't uh, mix uh, its roots with the rotundifolia in the wetlands. But, I looked repeatedly in that, in that area, in the area in question. Some of this is growing out of standing water there, which is atypical for a, um, a fact, uh, a plant. And just the anatomy and the features, as I explained, if you've read the, the narrative I provided, the, it's, it's very uh, simple to determine whether you're dealing with Glauca or um, 
a rotunda foliar, if, if this spines break off in your skin or in your clothing, you can pretty much determine that that is, um, is the upland species. And if it's, there are big honkers like this um, that don't break off typically and that, are, that do a lot of damage to your skin, um, that's one diagnostic. You can also use the leaves, the fruits, and other things that are not readily available. Glob is also usually uh, perennial uh, or uh, evergreen, whereas uh, the rotunda foliar isn't. There's no leaves out there now. Um, they also, because my bot botanical skills are, you know, have, uh, have brackets on them, um, I asked a botanist who works in my office, who's quite well credentialed, works with some of the most endangered plants on the Cape and on Martha's Vineyard and other places. And who would that be? Uh, Brett, Brett uh, Trowbridge. Um, he's currently working on, on a multi a plant that occurs three or four pla places in the state uh, over on the vineyard uh, and has some of the previous work with it on the, on the, uh, on the Cape and j the Heritage Program accepts his credentials for surveyors and other and identification and translocations, that sort of thing. Which is well beyond his, you know, that's kind of like using a nuclear bomb for, uh, you know, to kill a, a weasel. But um, essentially, he, he backed me up on, on that identification since I figured that someone with more pedigree would be appropriate. <clears throat> so in, in view of that, if you have the, this is a fac facultative plant. Mr. Haynes' data sheet that we provided uh, there with the annotations on it, <clears throat> he shows a three to two majority of upland plants. When you properly ad identify that, his data sheet itself supports the presence of a wetland community. I provided three sets, upland and wetland match sets, done on locus there uh, on the 8th, 8th of this month, I guess it was. Um, and the, I think they speak for themselves. I did notice one typo, the, the wet 2-3 uh, sheet is an equal sign where it should be a plus sign in the basal area of the tree uh, measurements. But um, other than that, the um, they have sheets, I think, speak for themselves that they support. We have hydric soils, we have a preponderance of wetland plants within the resource area, and, and a good portion of it also has a seasonally standing water, which uh, the regulations also, the BBW at least, uh, indicate that in the event of a uh, conflict or uh, indecision or some, some uh, word of that nature, that the presence of prolonged standing or flowing water is also an indicator. Uh, of BBW. This is not a BBW necessarily, but it's we've been asked to use the same criteria, the same methodology to determine the site's commission, uh, and we did so, and we, we think those data sheets com uh, combined with Mr. Haynes's speak for themselves. So <clears throat> in summary of what we, the, um, and we've also, what we're asking this commission, and it is a bit ambitious because of limitations on access and that sort of thing, are I think four in number. Um, and I'll just enumerate those for the record. The vernal pool status out there, we believe, based on the rock is calling, thousands of peepers from that uh, basin, even as recently as today, but beginning on April 3rd uh, and continuing in any, any of the warm days, we uh, were quite convinced that that has a sufficient hydro period to support obligate vernal pool species on the island, which is very trim. Um, and we urge the commission to uh, confirm that for, so that uh, for both the, for all the parties involved, benefit uh, to understand what the, what the uh, limitations that would impair or impart on, on all these properties with regard to the bylaw performance standards. Um, so that's a regulatory, it's not a regulatory um, resource area under the Act, but it is under uh, the bylaw. Uh, it does have ramifications under the Act, but it's not a resource area in and of itself. The ILSF, we think, needs to be quantified before any activity goes on anywhere adjacent within uh, numerous horizontal feet of this property or of this uh, resource area, we think it needs to be uh, determined. Sometimes ILSF can be quite pervasive over and above the uh, vegetated wetland, depending on the topography, the contributing watershed, and uh, other factors. It can be sometimes places that are, don't appear to ever experience flooding, but nonetheless, if you do the appropriate calculation, they can sometimes exceed. I don't think that's the case here, but um, it certainly, in my estimation, extends out into these wetland flags and possibly slightly beyond that. That needs to be quantified so that if any impacts are proposed there uh, by any of the owners of that the property that uh, they, they can be appropriately quantified and then um, dealt with under the Mass Wetland Protection Act as well as the bylaw as land subject to flooding. <coughs> um, the, uh, and again, the extent of the uh, vegetated wetland, we believe, uh, 
what I've just uh, delivered to you and the materials you've delivered for the record, that these flags are, are accurate uh, in the depiction of the extent of vegetative wetland as defined under the bylaw, as well as uh, federal 404. Um, it wouldn't be, if, if in fact there is no, we still aren't absolutely convinced that there's no outlet start, uh, feature there, but on going on that presumption in it's not a bordering vegetative wetland, then it would meet the, uh, the other two regulatory criteria for wetlands and needs to be addressed appropriately in the event of any proposal to alter that or alter the buffer zone regularly under the bylaw. Um, I believe that's uh, the gist of our, uh, in, our request under the determination. The materials, we did support, provide you some supporting materials uh, on methodology for determination of ILSF, um, both policy 85.2, uh, which is you know online and quite readily available from the DEP on uh, the status and, and determination of it, as well as a um, uh, excerpt from a PowerPoint pre presented by Mark Stinson at MACC meeting uh, from the DEP Western Region Regional Office on uh, the methodology for determination of the ILSF. And we did, we, as, um, as Kevin said, we did uh, offer to at our expense to that determination with access allowed on the property that, that was not provided. So we uh, think somebody needs to do that before there's any alteration of that resource area. So if I may, if I may summarize what the applicant is asking the commission to do. One is to issue a positive determination that these button flags that have been stolen by Mr. Butler from Oxville are correct and show the weapon resource areas affecting these properties to remand the local order of conditions issued to the CRECA Trust back to the Commission and require that applicant to file under the State Act since they concede and agree that there is isolated land subject to flooding affecting that property and that's a state matter and three, determine through a topographical survey what the boundaries are of the isolated land subject to flooding. And fourthly, under your authority, go out and determine if there's a vernal pool on the correct property. And note that that local order provides that the, the owner applicant for that order is supposed to do that, but there's no time frame for them to do it. Now is the time. This is the operative time of the year when spring is here, peepers are out, to see if there are any fairy shrimp on that property, and if so, determine that it's a vernal pool. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, yeah, Dave. If, if, it, if it's appropriate, I don't know if the commission has questions. If they I, I just have actually one question for Brian. Um, it, it may be a moot point at this point. But uh, one thing I just am stuck on from visiting the site is the presence of a lot of eastern red cedar. They're stumps, or they're cut stumps now, but they're they're really close to where the wetland's been flagged. And I know that you know through calculations, and I'm no wetland expert, I don't, don't pretend to be, but I am a I am an arborist, and I know that the root zone on a tree extends well beyond you know right. the stump, yeah. which would put a lot of this which would put a lot of the root zone of these eastern red cedar well within the wetland or, the, you know, what, what's been flagged. So I guess I'm just asking, how, how are those, how is that factored in and what determinations are made for maybe things that are, you know, aren't seen underground? Yep, uh, well, the, the root zone of the cedar isn't, I mean, and you probably actually know better, better so correct me if I'm wrong, is it going to extend tremendously beyond the tree crown? No, actually it's about, Five times. Okay, well, then you correct me. Um, although, the, and again, I, I think we haven't ex excavated this, but the soil's there clearly hydric. We had water observable uh, even uh, two weeks ago, I guess it was, uh, before the last meeting, in holes within five or so horizontal feet of that. So, or, you know, the growing season is upon us. Things are leafing out there. Um, I, cedars are somewhat averse, but they're back up. They're not, uh, they're not an upland plant, so mm -hmm. they... Um, they have a little tolerance for, they certainly don't grow, aren't predominant in the bottomlands and all the little, little uh, gullies and uh, frost bottoms in the, on the island here, but they 
are not absolutely averse to um, occasion, you know, seasonal wetness. And the definition for a wetland based on soil profile is is a um, seven consecutive days during the growing season of saturation at or near the soil surface. Mm -hmm. So the two aren't mutually exclusive. Yeah. Um, the flags that I placed in the field are actually inside. They're in the root zone, certainly. Um, but if that were the case, if they were that averse, uh, if it was five times the, the crown mm -hmm. width, then, you know, you wouldn't... Yeah, I mean, it's, not always, a, it's not always a, you know... Right, but you wouldn't represent that cedars need to stay, yeah, 15 feet horizontally from a wetland in all circumstances. So, um, And stumps are actually just outside our actual boundary line. Mm -hmm. If they were present, if they were sent there, maybe, you know, I probably would have hung it on the adjacent side. So maybe there's a, a fudge factor of two or three feet for uh, flag four here. Um, I can see, but based on the soils and the remnant vegetation, it's... And the soils are still pretty compelling here. They do go up and as you get a little bit um, more distal from here. But um, this this flag, I think, maybe uh, a little three feet or something toward flag 65, but um, within the margin of error. But it's not like a 10 foot change or a five foot change in my estimation. Um, and again, the remaining vegetation downslope or downside, if you will, of the cedars is is all uh, dominated by hydrophytes. Uh, good evening, David Haynes. Um, a couple of things. Uh, this area is is very flat. There isn't much of a grade change all through this area. During that high water period, the water did come up slightly above our flags that were out there. Did not come uh, did not come up to Mr. Butler's flags anywhere near that area. That area didn't didn't flood. I would like to discuss that in a minute as part of the isolated land subject flood. Um, however, today the, the water level has dropped probably five or six inches since that time. I did not see any leaves coming out there. I wouldn't say we're in the growing season yet here. We're just getting into it at home where it's slightly warmer. But um, and it has to be added near the ground surface for a significant portion of the growing season. Um, the cedar trees are basically at the same elevation as the delineated wetland, um, so they would experience the same hydrologic conditions. Um, I know that, that um, Mr. Perry and Mr. Carlson have been out there and looked at it. Um, the soils, I still think, are questionable. They, they extend outside. They extend in, in, in other directions. There's, there's this berm up in here is loaded with the same sand. It's just a white sand that we all see in Antarctica. Um, anyway, I'm going to leave that to, to Mr. Carlson and Mr. Perry and Hewlett. Um, my delineation is, ba was, was base, is, is basically at the break and slope, and uh, I felt it was a good delineation that was reviewed by the agent for the commission. Um, isolated land subject flooding. Uh, it is a state resource area. Um, it does not have a buffer zone. We have agreed, uh, and we have been out there and, and looked at where the uh, basically the rack line was for the for the flooding this winter, and we have the, our surveyor is going to go and pick up some points and carry it around so that anything that would be within that area would be affected. We can also also look at it and see if it actually does qualify for isolated land subject to flooding. The, the you haven't been on our property obviously, so you don't know. Right now, there's a there's a, a pool in here connected, and then up in here we're going to do some area uh, and average depth calculations to determine whether it is or not. Um, and and we are in the process of doing that. However, we're going to base it on what was the maximum observed flood elevation, which is one of the criteria within isolated land subject to flood unless it's disputed, okay? They have presented, presented no evidence to dispute that this is, it ever gets higher than this. So we're going to, with Mr. O'Connor, who's here, who's been involved with, who's the, who's the applicant? He, he's, the, he's the trustee of the, of the, of the 40 Pocknell property, has been involved with the property, I believe, Michael, for over 40 years? Yes, 40 years, and has never seen the water as high as it was this year. So we're going to take that as evidence that this is the maximum of the state. 
the commission has seen high water all over this island. We've, we've had numerous discussions about water being in spots that it's never been before all winter. So we're going to use that as a, as the as the threshold for what is the limits of isolated land subject to flooding. Um, we're going to pick up that elevation and use it. Um, we would be able to extend it across the site. Right now, what's really critical is in this area only, so we're not going to survey the whole property. Um, it, if we if we do acknowledge or agree that it is isolated in the flooding, then it would be under the state. I know this isn't part of it, but the previous work that was approved, if it's outside of it, it's still not under jurisdiction of the state because the state does not have a buffer zone on it. And neither does your, your bylaw. So it's, but that's, that's that, and this is this. Uh, in terms of Vernal Pool, we have been out there, we went out there today and started looking at it. Um, we found no evidence of fairy shrimp. I, I, frankly, I expected to see them. Uh, we discussed, we discussed the Vernal Pool previously, and came up and was dealt with in, in order of conditions. We agreed to do that. We're still agreeing to do that. Um, and we are, we found no evidence of fairy shrimp today. We found several other species. And being a geologist, um, we can't identify caterpillar. <laughs> we found ostracods, amphipods, uh, midges, snow fleas, and yeah, yeah. So, um, we just found. I was just at a vernal pool on Monday, too, and I found all of that, but no fairy shrimp. So, okay. it might be a couple of days early still. I yeah, expected I'm, I'm, to see them because it was warm enough. But. I'm planning on going out there again tomorrow and then maybe next week. Yeah. And just to make sure we did it. Um, we heard chorusing peepers today. I heard chorusing peepers yesterday in my riding week. So, I mean, chorusing peepers are an indicator that it might be a vernal pool there, and I totally respect that, but they're not. They're not obligate. They're not obligate, they're not obligate. Not obligate. yeah. The only obligate here is a fairy. Mm -hmm. And we, 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 we did uh, look around, we looked in here, in here, in here, and in here, and found no evidence of them. And we will look some more. I, I, I expected to see it. Mm -hmm. So that's basically, um, that's where we're coming from. Any questions from the commission for anybody here? I have a question for Jeff. Um, if that's all right. Sure. Um, one of the things, if it does determine, it looks like both sides are kind of agreeing that there is likely to be land subject to uh, coastal flooding, or to uh, isolated land subject to flooding, I mean, uh, and I understand that there's no buffer. Um, does that mean we would still have to remit the original one back to us and still put it forward through the state, regardless of the edge, because then that's both under state jurisdiction or our jurisdiction, even if there's no buffer. Legally, does that change the, the process? Yes. Yes, it does in some de some degrees and uh -huh. no in others. Is it would be essentially issuing out something that doesn't list all of the resource areas that affect the property. Um, the difference may be if there's nothing that's proposed or no activity taking place within that, you would simply be adding in that as a regulatory a regulatory body on the property to to get that memorialized correctly. So that would be a change. Now, if there's no work proposed in that, obviously applying the performance standards, that would be a little different. So if there's no work proposed in that area and without the buffer zone. It's very similar to if we were in the, in the flood zone. Mm -hmm. If you were on the lot and the flood zone crossed through that lot, you still may be subject to having to apply. If you're not doing activity in there, you just you don't have, have to meet those performance it. standards. Mm -hmm. Well, my other um, point that I was going to make is even, <coughs> and I'm not making any Assumptions are verbalizing any of these wetland flags, but even if we did establish this this greater extent of this wetland flags, that doesn't mean that this project as proposed wouldn't still be we wouldn't be able to grant a waiver. We might be able to for well, the same exact work. I think the important thing is to remember, without getting into it, is one the the line that we're looking at that's shown on there mm -hmm. is the delineated line of the vegetated wetland. So. Mm -hmm. 
the isolated land subject to flooding will be different more than likely than that delineated line. That delineated line is also a line that was reviewed by our third party reviewer who agreed with the line that's shown on the original plan. Um, whether or not a resource area was, was missed or improperly identified is a different question. Um, again, the request that's in front of us is simply a resource area delineation. Mm -hmm. The result of that change in delineation or possible acceptance of that requires a modified review or an amendment to something that's existing, that's something that would be taken separately. It's not part of this application. We have the ability to just mm -hmm. jump around from, from permit type no, to permit that's, type. That's helpful. Because um, there's, there's hearing and notice requirements and all those other sure. so, um, so when we're looking at that's what we have. Um, so it's important to keep in mind when we're reviewing this that we have a very specific list of requests. I think Mr. Dale outlined them pretty clearly. And the decision you guys are going to have to make is whether or not you've been presented enough information to delineate the resource areas that are requested. I mean, I don't want to say we got ourselves into trouble the first time with some speculation, but simply saying that we think there might be, because both sides says they think there might be, for us to say that it exists is kind of a dicey slope because if they go out and do the topography, if it turns out that it's not there, well, we just said it there was. Or can we not, with a, can we not within our uh, discretion, with a positive 2B, just find that the uh, resource areas that have been presented to us are not confirmed? You could. Yeah. But certainly, it, I would say if you don't feel you have enough information to make a, a determination affirming the resource area and boundaries, then I would say your best course of action would be then to issue that you don't have enough information to determine them to be accurate. So that's kind of the question of the day. And that's... Can I go so. back to... Um, so going back to just the land subject to flooding, um, I know both of them have been discussing this. Is this something that we need to separately ask someone like Bruce to go out and verify um, the land subject to flooding? Well, the land subject to flooding is a little tricky because it's not something that you go on the ground and just you know, dig some test holes and look at soils and do land subject to flooding is very much based on, you know, drainage calculations and depressions and observed areas of flooding and those things where it's not as simple as, I can't believe I'm going to say this, it's not as simple as going out and trying to delineate a BBW or an IBW. It's, it's a lot more involved. I'm just trying to figure out. It's something that's, that's difficult. You just don't walk out onto the ground and say it's here unless you're observing a, a high water that you know is the highest high water. I think there's a specific protocol to determine the boundaries, and Mr. Butler can speak to that. Yeah, we for, and I may ask Art for backup since he's the survey, but essentially, Art, fill me in where I on this quote. Um, you, you calculate the contributing rainfall to this to the watershed, the micro watershed associated with that. You assume the coefficient of infiltration for the non basin contributing portion is as whatever the coefficient for this woodland type is in the pervasive in the area. You presume that the basin itself is an impervious um, concavity, and that the and also you have to ca calculate the groundwater intercept um, and, re and subtract that out. Uh, but Art might be able to s explain a little more. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a few comments on the isolated land subject to flooding. First, in response to Mr. Haynes, he tells us that they're going to do a survey to determine whether it holds enough water to be considered isolated land, so whether you have the quarter acre foot, but then tells us they're not going to do a survey of the whole property. So I don't see how you're going to find determine this without doing a survey of the whole property. We've offered to do it at our own expense and have not been, if, they, if they're not going to let, if they don't want to accept that, then they at least have to do that on their own to, you, you can't it's just survey, no please David, you cannot just survey a part of this to make that determination. Further, the Isolated land subject to flooding is based on engineering calculations, not even surveying. I think this is very important to get a distinction here between civil engineering and surveying. Surveying is a matter of measuring, and the engineering is a matter of the calculations. When you get into hydro, hydro, <clears throat> the hydraulic calculations, these should be done by a licensed engineer. And if they don't want to provide that, and we've offered to do it at our expense, one way or the other, you should get the information. And then to have it said that this is not a boundary in dispute, if this isn't a dispute, I don't know what possibly is. 
And so reading from directly from 85 policy 852 that we submitted, in the event of a dispute, calculations regarding the extent of the 100-year flood are used to determine the probable extent of such water. The lateral boundary of ILSF is the area that will be inundated during such event. You know, I mean, <clears throat> no matter what you might think of back to this motivate, just the science, just the answers, it's all that we're looking to figure out here, no matter where you come down on this. And you need the data to do that. And we're willing to do the work and to do the data, but we need to be able to come on the property. Otherwise, if they want to do just the survey, and then I'll do the engineering calculations, I can do it based on that. Um, but somehow, you need to know what this basin is. And so we tried to provide you, you know, this is information that's been submitted to you, exactly what I read from. And I think I could just show you, you know, these are the kind of calculations that are, this is all, all in the package, of how to determine an ILS outer boundary. I mean, it's, it, it's just a matter of, of math and, and having the information. So, you know, if we can't do that because you don't have the information and they're telling you they're not going to do it is what we heard, then I don't think, you know, that they can tell you whether or not it is or it isn't. And we certainly contend based upon um, the information available to us that it is. So I, I, I guess, you know, that's, that's sort of Makes it pretty plain that what we have here is a, is a personal dispute among neighbors. It, 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 but I can yeah, that. I, I object to that. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know what, this is a matter Mr. Of Chairman, we have every right to evaluate what's, what's presented to us, and we're being told it's in dispute. And we're being told that the neighbors won't it allow. It is the reason that's okay. okay. Won't allow. And so, I, so that, makes, that just makes the point very clear. Well, I, think. I know it, Mike. I, I know what you're trying to say here, but that's not our, that's not our problem. That's their problem. Our problem is to come up we're and determine... Which we're under no the, obligation to, to yeah, come up with well, something here that okay, fiddles around with a previous that, decision just, we've made. Who else on the commission would support Mike's opinion on this? Okay, Mike, I'm just going <laughs> to say we've got to stop this now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mr. Chairman, we just, heard your point of view and we're rejecting it. David? Um, just, just to set it straight, when I said that we were going to determine we were going to estimate whether or not there was there was another enough standing water on the site to, to be qualified as isolated land subject to flooding. I mean, if, if we say it isn't, then we'd have to do a survey to determine that that the standing water that we observed this year uh, would not qualify for isolated land subject to flooding. I think it I think it does, and we sort of we, we conceded that last time. Now. I, I'm, I'm wondering. I want to. I want to take a few more measurements to to see if we have the the, the surface area and the depth to qualify with a with a quarter acre foot in there. I think it does, but I'm not. I'm not positive. We will verify that. The thing about the in, in the in the, the boundary, um, it is you use, you can use the highest unless it's disputed. And I don't mean. I know we're in the dispute part. I don't mean the. But. Nothing has been presented that disputes that, that that flood elevation goes higher than what was observed this year. We've got <coughs> local information that's been there for 40 years that hasn't seen it any higher than this. It hasn't seen it this high, and that is, is relative information. And that is, it, and when I say we're going to do survey, we're going to locate it. This is the property that I believe that the, the request for determination is on. I don't. Is it on this property? It as is. Well? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, and, you know, the border well, I mean, we can, would be we, important. I mean, we need a border, survey. The, the, the well, extent it, might be important. We we need to know how far it comes this way, and if we can document with some spot grades that it doesn't come up into the building site, which isn't part of this application, well, and any future will have a benchmark for the elevation of the flooding that we can apply to any work in this area. And in we need a complete we, survey, David. We do That's not, what the standards say. And we do not need a complete survey. We do. We do not. In well, this in case, depends. I think we do. Yes, so can I make an explanation that I think you haven't, you haven't presented any no, Mr. Butler, One please. at a time, please. Yeah, One at a time. Through the chair. I was still speaking. So no information has been presented that says it goes any higher. Now, excuse me. 
there are two categories, and I think Mr. Haynes referred to them, dispute or not dispute. Sometimes it's patently obvious if you have a measuring cup with a little lip on it, you fill up, you can know what the volume of that is going to hold, and, this, and anybody could figure that out. There's no dispute. In this case, we don't have a lip or a, a invert that's defined in the field where the water would, would overtop the basin and the, thus limit the, the volume of that basin. We don't, that's not obvious out there, at least that we've seen. And as uh, has been re repeatedly said, it's flat, flat, flat out here, and my flags are in the flat areas of the cedar. Actually, two of these cedar stumps are probably on hummocks, about four or five, six inches above the surrounding grade. The transitioning grade from the wetland flag here to my flag three is probably on the order of centimeters, and I mean you know, two, three, uh, if that, maybe even less. Um, so the determination of where that flood extends is very much in question now. There's no nice to find a constricting or a limiting invert out there in the field. You can say, when it gets to this, the water goes out, and we can measure that volume. So because this is disputed on that basis, you have to look, take a more comprehensive, not global, but uh, watershed approach to determining that. In order to, it, it may it may be less than it could be less than the BBW. It could mm -hmm. very well be uh, internal to the BBW. It could be considerably outside it because everybody keeps saying this is so flat. Then it may be it may go on all the way out to the ditch. But that needs to be determined, I think, in order to do a, a, a thorough job of, of regulating that area and any impacts to it. Okay. Um, I guess the question for us is where do we go from here? <laughs> and I'm still not convinced about the soil surveys. I mean, it seems like we've got one set of experts saying one thing and the other one saying the other thing. And the soils look tighter to me. I think the soils are actually a lot more of a smoking gun, as it were, mm -hmm. than, the, than the plants. Because with Greenbrier, you know, you see it in wetlands, you see it bordering in wetlands. I mean, it could be just because I know less about plants than about soils, but at least the two soil cores I saw looked hydric to me. Um, but each of us has an opinion yeah, on We're not soil it. scientists. No. Um, and if I had those results and it was you know, five upland plants and two wetland plants, then I, we, I would have put placed the flags appropriately. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not we're, we're cherry picking parameters. Mm -hmm. yeah, if they're no, mutually supportive of each other here, as well as the hydrology. I mean, the soil. If there's flooding 15 feet past flag 65 here and there's three inches of grade change up to my flags, then within 18 inches of the surface, there's going to be saturation for an extended period of time, assuming the water table is, is flat in that area, which I'm guessing it is. So, so even if it doesn't have to have sandy, I think it's been remarked in these proceedings and in the prior minutes that it has to be you know, surface water, it has to be for the majority of the growing season. No, it has to be saturated soils at or near the soil surface for an extended period of time. If you read the citations in my first submittal, uh, three or four citations, federal, uh, the new wheat pick soil manual, it's seven to 20 days during the growing season, soil saturation at or near the surface. It's not but is that every flooded all year. Season? That's the average, yeah. Or I think even an event is see more like soil see that. Yeah. I mean, we've discussed that out on locations with Jeff before, where we've looked at soil cores and looked at saturation points. <clears throat> I mean, how, uh, independently looking at the two sets of soil cores, does Bruce have an opinion or do you have an opinion based on that as to whether that is one of the three? Or, I mean, maybe I'm making some wrong assumptions. To me, it looks like it's verifying a wetland fly. Well, I don't want to speak for Bruce because he's not here. I know his report that he issued with the original filing verified the line that showed in yellow and red. That's there. But so that's. I looked at the new information. Like well, he has. Right, the, the stuff that, that just came in. Um, my looking at the soils, um, I would say a lot of it depends upon where you're, where you're looking and where you're doing. I mean, there. I don't think anyone will argue that in some cases they're. Pretty marginal soils. I mean, you go. It's not a big distance that you're looking at. I, mean, I, I, I think for for our standpoint here. I mean, you're, uh, to get put in the position of having to essentially pick between two sets of data that are in conflict is very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. And it's not a situation that's there, but it's something that you guys need to be sure that the information that you guys have is is complete enough to do that. And if you're being asked I to make a set of... question, Mr. Chairman. Are we uh, now at 
uh, item H on our agenda, where it would be the commission is going to deliberate. Well, the reason I ask, because uh, if that's where we are, then it goes on to say commission should not be interrupted during that deliberation, and I would just like to know when we've reached that point at the table here. Not there yet. No, we're still, I don't know. We're just, just trying to get just through this. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we're just trying to work our way through this in whatever way we can. So we do have a couple options. So we do have the ability as the commission. Does have a coin? As part of this, no, no, as part of this application, if if one of the primary and main concerns is the evaluation of isolated land subject to flooding, we do have a provision in our bylaw that allows the access to private property for the determination being requested. Mm -hmm. um, and as part of that, we also can authorize our agents and applicants to do that. So if there's something that we need to get done as far as surveying and engineering to make that determination. We can't guess. That's something we typically, as a general practice of the commission, try to encourage the parties involved to provide that information, but we do have the ability to, to go do it if that's a determination that we're being requested to do. Um, that's just, I could read it if I really need I to, but I, I don't need to. Want that, right? This is yeah. a case, yeah. too, where we also have, we're also in the benefit of some degree of, with this application, there's also another, I know, won't be in appeal, it's still an active application and filing and permit held by the commission that can still be reviewed under the same provisions, and if we need to hire someone to do it, those things can be passed along to the applicant as an expense to them for what it takes to do. Um, and I think we find the best soils person we can find within that's what I the think. United States well, of America. <laughs> let's well, we, no, we can just get someone that's available well, to us. Yeah, we well, talked about that last time, getting an independent third party. Yeah. So well, we have two people well, disagreeing. I, I, I think the question is we, we have an independent third party that does right. essentially soils exactly. and vegetation review. I was referring more towards. We could also just find that we're not convinced of positive 2B. We could find we could make that finding here today. We did hear that there was time sensitivity at our last uh, meeting on this topic. Or not make that finding. Yeah, we it's could not, not make that finding. Yeah, that would be our that would be, the, be our discretion what so to do here. I I think I was referring more to not necessarily specifically looking at because we already have someone that does do that for us and has done it for us previously. But if we're concerned, we do not have a licensed engineer that we just have on staff that just does calculations and those things. If that's something that we need to do and you feel that it fits within the bylaw, we can certainly require that to be done. It's our typical practice usually to have whoever is the applicant provide the information for review or to do it. This is a case where I don't believe we're going to get that information from either party at the moment. That's clearly going to help us make the determination of whether one of the resource areas being requested of us to determine we're going to get that information to make that determination. So, I think we need to. Yeah. I mean, if, so if it's probably arguably on the back pond, too. We only need three different, you know. Cause the system well, the vertical pool is a little different, too, so. We're going to find out about the vertical pool. Yes. The yeah. commission has the right to go on the 40 park mm -hmm. number of property. And with their own expert for their own pools, we were going to provide that information. Mm -hmm. As I said, frankly, today, I'm not there expecting to see fair trip, but I didn't see it. But we, and we will continue that. If the commission wants to send something in for the, the whole thing about isolated land subject to flooding, I thought basically we had conceded that it was isolated land subject to flooding. And so therefore, a survey of the basin would not be necessary if we all agreed on what was the, the limit. And I, I didn't really think that there was that much of a dispute about the limit, and I thought we would be accommodating by picking up the observed maximum level that, that's out there and putting it on the property over in, in this area. Uh, and we can make notes to, to show that it isn't in the, in the proposed house site and things like that, and when we come in with, or we could do actually specific areas in here to show that it isn't there. Um, <coughs> you know, I mean, I really didn't think it was necessary. If, if we can agree that it is or is not, it, if we agree that it is isolated land subject to flooding, then we're only talking about where the boundary is, and that would need the survey. If they want to, I guess they're saying that they don't believe that this is the actual limit because it's right. the highest right. it's been in 40 years. Well, 
we accept your proposal that we all agree that there's isolated land subject to flooding. We I, accept I that. But we do need to find out what the boundary is using the proper and correct protocols suggested by the DEP. There's two, there's two, two ways to I do think it. The, one way is well, I think the, the I think we, guys don't, don't yeah. cross talk, please. Uh, I think Mr. Gasparro has addressed how to do it, and Mr. Buckler can too. I'm just curious about a simple measure of going to the records of the, in the weather and looking at how much rainfall we had in this period of, because it started in September or so, just buckets of rain. I mean, three, three, three inch rains this fall and several other rains and then all the snow in the winter and looking at how did this stack up to, to um, historic rainfall events? Now, how far back can you do we need to go on this? Because this, to me, I mean, I haven't been here that long, but I've never seen anything like this. If I may, Mr. Chairman, I think that that's why DEP put out a policy. You know, you got you got to follow the policy. And we can say that we think it's that, but that's the way that it should be done. You should follow the policy, do the calculations the same way you would size drainage. It's based upon, you know, published yeah, the engineering the data the that you use for a certain inch per hour for a hundred year storm. But what you need in order to do that, there's there's two two aspects to this. One, what is the contributing watershed? Mm -hmm. And then two, what is the basin? What 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 is this this hold? And then we can determine whether the boundary is here or is it here. And again, I, I think that, that that's an important piece of information to know. We all agree it is, but then where does it stop? Whether um, they feel that it doesn't doesn't matter where that boundary is, or whatever buffer zone, we feel it does matter because it's a proper identification of the resource areas, plain and simple. You can determine the next step later back to whatever project, whether it matters or not. This is simply a question of resource areas. And I think that as well, we're spending we're back spending an awfully lot of time on the isolated land subject for flooding, but I think you got to go back and look at this again, especially where you ask for the data forms, both Mr. Haynes' data forms and Mr. Butler's data forms support that it, in fact, is vegetated wetland. So I, I think that, that that's a, you know, this boundary in here also needs to be, be considered, and I think you have everything that you asked for to make that determination. Again, the only thing I was asking for is whether the commission wanted to have a third party review it and give us some advice basically on how they would I was just trying to think of a way to remove it from the back and forth argument. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I personally would because I, I think in a situation like this um, you guys are obviously going to have differing lines yeah. and anyone is going to have a little bit off. I mean you can sure. soil test six inches away whatever so I think it is important we get a third party not involved with either to go out to raise soils, plants and get the accurate topo on this. Because that's the only way you're going to get the, yeah. the land subject to flooding um, the, the size of the base. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the back and forth is not helpful to anybody. There are, two ways to get, there are two ways to get isolated land subject to flooding boundaries. One is maximum surge in water. It's, a, it's, it's absolutely acceptable. And if there's a dispute, and the dispute is if somebody doesn't think that's, that's the real and they have evidence that that's not the right number. And, and, and we've all talked about historic flooding. And this is, it was winter time with frozen ground, an unbelievable amount of snow, rain, and water. And, and I mean, we're willing to, we're willing to, to map out where the flooding extended to this year. We're happy to do that. And, and, and how it relates to the work that's proposed on my client's property. Uh, up in here and how, how it would affect here. We could, we could give you spot grades all the way across here based on the elevation that, that we see for, for land subject to flooding. If, 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 if they won't accept that, which is what they're saying, they, they want to do the drainage calculations. They want to, you do have to do exactly what Kevin and, and Brian and Art are saying. You have to do a detailed survey to, to determine exactly what the shape of, of this basin is, and, and then you do the drainage calculations, what's the, what's the watershed, what, what's the infiltration characteristics, and how much water is going to flow in there, 
during a, a 100 year event. You could argue, actually, but, that. But, you, but the way I proposed it, by us looking at what was there today, that was the highest it was observed by somebody who had been watching this plan for 40 years. Excuse that's me, what I'm thinking. Does, 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 does it remark that? And does he go out and he goes, oh, no, it's, it was at the face of that stump. What's his visual? We, 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 look, we Well, we have photographs of where it was at the highest level. We have your photographs. I have photographs of where it was up in this area. And it was above my wetland flag. That old was, I know it was. It was up in this area. We can we can document where that was. There is evidence of a rack line. There's evidence of, sat of, of wet soils and, and, and leaf litter that's been disturbed and discolored. And we would use that. We, we agree. I mean, we can, we can meet, okay, we let's, the, let's, we, let's look. We, I think we've heard both sides of the argument. Thing, no, no, no more. Uh, I know already. I've enough. I just want to respond to Ms. Harris. No, no, no thanks. We've, I think we've heard it all. <laughs> we've heard it all about four times tonight alone. So, and we understand that this is, uh, you know, something that's not being agreed on. Um, as far as David's point, I can say, I mean, I've only been watching for 20 years. But I just would say that Hummock Pond was higher by probably two feet than it has ever been in my experience there, based on how much flooding was on the trails. And Biblical. <laughs> how much, how high it was on the banks and things. I know, I mean, I know it's never been anywhere near this high. Exactly how much, I don't know, but nowhere near this high. Well, the point I was going to make is I understand exactly what David's saying, and there can just do it from evaluation of the high, high that you're seeing now. You could argue that if they go with the established DEP thing of looking at the basin and the watershed, it might be a smaller line than he's proposing. Mm -hmm. um, right. They're willing to take the chance. Yeah, they're yeah, willing, willing, willing to and take the chance. We haven't had a hundred year event in any of this discussion with the kind of biblical okay, yeah. stuff. None of it, I don't think, has been a hundred year event in, since last year. Not a single event. I mean, we look event. forward to a third party. That's what the criteria are based upon. Yeah, but yeah, you, yeah. So and it, it, you could say it's anecdotal even with 40 years worth of observations, it still might not equal a hundred years. I don't know. I don't it seems we have high to me. But. 40 years of staff gauge data or anything equivalent to that. We don't have 40 years. I don't know the weather street data next to my house runs dry, not because I don't care. Mm -hmm. I might walk by it every day, but I couldn't tell you the periodicity that it floods and doesn't flood. Yeah. Let's let a third party resolve this. Yeah, yeah we're, we're going to go back to no objection that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a quick question. Is there a protocol for soil chemistry in for denoting yes. wet for lines as opposed to observational? It doesn't seem we've ever used that as a particular oh, as, far as, as opposed to operating because it seems like the soils are visually difficult to, to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the whole color thing is just exactly. We're it it seems very like super. It's, it's, to me, I would think if there is a if there is a chemistry option, that, that should be looked at as well. Well, there's so. there's redox yeah. state, which is what the soils indicate. The right. color indi indicates whether how reducing it is. I mean, you could measure the amount of oxygen in it. And you could measure that level of precipitation. There, there are ways to do that. Well, I think. Well, 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 it would, it would have to be something that would, it would have to be something that would be an approved practice, other than an assumption. I'm just curious if there was a, a, a no, absolutely, but. Option. Well, so I'm not familiar with anyone that does some sort of chemical analysis to determine nitrous yeah. yeah. I've never, I've never seen her. So that's, but a, a lot of that's kind of surprising. We do seem to have moved the goal line a little bit, the goal post, <laughs> because last time we were here, we were the data sheets were the determinant, and then when I made this correction on, on Mr. Haynes' data sheet, so that now it supports our case, and all of a sudden, and I'm not arguing against peer review, but I think there's been a little shift here that vegetation was adequate, and then until we made the rectification that this is actually a fact plan. Maybe we could clarify that, Mr. Uh, the Chairman. Would be, well, under the, uh, well, under the possible findings before us, uh, and thank you for the, well, well, I'll just go as quickly as I can here. Positive 2B says the boundaries of the resource areas are not confirmed by this determination, regardless of whether such boundaries contained on the plans, attached to determination, or to the request for determination. We could make that finding right here and now and end this matter for the moment and to put this thing back in the, under the court appeal where it belongs. And so yeah, I'll make that motion party. that we make a positive to be, Mr. Chairman. We always kind of agree that a third party should be involved yeah. in this. I don't think that ever is ever in question. Well, well I would feel a lot meeting. better if a third party was looking at plants that hadn't been mowed down some time <laughs> yeah. ago. You know, looking at little stubs on the ground, month? like something with leaves on it. Well, a third party's going to need to look at anything from the vernal pond now, though. Yeah. 
we, we have someone that looks at plants and soils. We hold a contract with them. Yeah. Lawrence Environmental does those reviews. Mm -hmm. How yeah. much, what, what experience in, I mean, have they taken classes in soil? <laughs> yes, they, they, they meet the qualifications to hold the contract with the town, which involves being able to do analysis of inland and coastal wetlands for vegetation and soils. Mm -hmm. I use my big government to talk for that. But that. So they can do that. I will say we don't have an engineer on staff directly to the commission that would be able to, if necessary, do the engineering calculations to determine isolated land subject to flooding. That's something that we would have to go through our procurement process to get. So I can't promise that's going to be the quickest. Well, but has Bruce, has, I think we've asked this question before, has Bruce made a determination which of the colored lines he thinks is correct? I know he, he approved the one line, but has he gone back and looked at the second line and gone, nah, this is no good? Well, that's what we're asking well, him to do. Correct. And he has the, the new data form, so he'll be out there again to do that. But his initial review affirmed the yellow and red line that he had originally looked at. <laughs> well, let's get Bruce to just so, reaffirm uh -huh. that as a, as a first step. Can I offer this one? If, I mean, I thought I was offering on the isolated land subject, but I thought I was offering a reasonable solution. Mm -hmm. if, if that's not acceptable to the commission, then we can allow the surveyors to go on and survey and do the basin and do the drainage calculation. I think it's, you know, this, this is a perfectly acceptable methodology that I have proposed. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what DEP suggests first. Mm -hmm. It's not what they, if they, they say as a last resort. Disputed. If, if that's not acceptable to the commission, then then we uh, can allow them to go on. We're happy to do the survey. I totally understand what you're saying. It doesn't mean that it's not acceptable to us. If the dispute, then we have to. Well, it, it's it'd be interesting for you to go out and put your line out there, figure out where it is, and then let them do it and see where yeah. the difference well, is. Well, I mean, frankly, I don't think my client wants to spend waste yeah. money on this. It's not, it's not cheap to do that. Mm -hmm. kind of sure. I mean, Were you willing to let them go out there and do the whole big shebang? Um, I believe I have to speak to my client, but I think he would probably, if that's the, if, if, well, if you're not going to accept what's the first standard of the DEP policy, which is the maximum is the requirement, um, and we can, I can go out there with Mr. Butler and we can make sure that we're on the same plane about where we observe flooding at its maximum um, and do that and do that in, in this area and the areas that are pertinent to the proposal. We'd like to do the survey. Mr. Chairman, may I speak? Yes. Um, Michael O'Connor, I'm a trustee of the Ellen Mary Cricket Special Needs Trust. Um, I would agree to have the rights pay for the survey using the town recommended contract, not the rights selected contract. If they want to pay for it, they can do that. But I, I don't feel it's impartial. I mean, just like we have the issue with where the flag should be, um, we'll have the same issue with the delineation if it's not a neutral third party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next. And it doesn't have to go through the procurement process, I wouldn't think, as long as it's one of the recommended vendors that the town uses. Let's get a third party to split the cost. Well, that seems fair. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you can just ask that you do it and whoever well, does it. Uh, third party can do the survey, they're just going to do the soil. They would do both. Well, we'll have someone do the plants and soils because we already have someone that does that for us. Mm -hmm. If it's above and beyond that, if we're going to be doing the survey too, the application that's in front of us has been applied for by the rights. And they'll be responsible. They will be responsible for that cost. If they come to an agreement with the other party, then and they come up to split it, then so be it. But that's we don't care who pays for it. pretty much. Yeah. Which that's your own problem. And the um, uh, uh, Cracker uh, Trust, if I'm getting it, could agree upon a surveyor and engineer to deal with that aspect of the, of the project, and you wouldn't have to go through the procurement process. That would be most that ideal to me. That would be provided <laughs> yeah. by that individual, by those individuals. That would be the easiest path. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one independent question? I'm sorry. Uh, 
um, can you have Bruce Laurentide review what was submitted to us as quote unquote evidence as far as soil records? Yes. Brian you know, he, he has that already. He knows he's supposed to be doing that. So okay. we just, it came in on Friday and it's, okay. we try not to get stuff back on Tuesday. Because that's kind so. of independent from taking your own. And yes. You know, or else going out there and actually but doing some. Which he should probably he do should both. Do, That's what I'm, I think he should do both. I think he should look at his fresh. data. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and it can change over time, too. I would say at some point you need the information to make the decision. If at some point the time becomes unreasonable to get that information, mm -hmm. then you obviously have to take action that sure you don't have the information. I think Mr. Reed's suggestion is a capital suggestion. And we'll agree on a survey on a third party. We'll pay for it. If Mr. Haynes and his client agree to that. Well, I'll put it this way. With one of the town recommended surveyors, not one selected by the Reds. No, we, we, we both have to agree on the survey. Okay. And the commission. And the commission. Well, they don't, they don't I don't want to speak for the commission, but as long as we get the information from a licensed engineer or surveyor that's stamping the plan and providing the calculations to back it up, well, I don't care if it's my grandmother or, or <laughs> her art, as long as they're licensed <laughs> and <laughs> and, <laughs> sure. and it's the part that you guys, and that you guys, you guys agree to. But the important part is we need the information to make a determination about isolated lands and flooding, and to do that, we need, as much as I hate to say it, a line on the plan that's backed up by the correct information. I think Mr. Haynes and I could come up with a survey. There's plenty to choose from. <laughs> well, and I think we should just stipulate that it does get approval of staff. The name, the, yeah. the firm selected is approved by it's staff. Good. If sure. staff's okay with that. You can find her. The, good luck finding her. Can I ask a question also? This is uh, Mr. O'Connor nope. again. Um, the movement of the flags, um, what I heard last meeting when I was here is it's very subjective and everybody every uh, person going out there will probably have a different flag. So we're basically saying, they say the flag should be here, we say the flag should be there. This third person's going to be the arbitrator and better than both of these. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm, I'm caught up in, I would, I'd love to have an exact science to say, here's the wetlands. Mm -hmm. But, and you know, and, and well, how would both parties feel about we draw a line right down the middle? We just measure that and draw a line right down the middle of between those flags and go, ta-da. Well, this is as accurate as anything else. I mean, yeah. even if I thought it was right, but I don't think it's. Let's well, I don't know that anybody's let's, right. Let's, let's get the, the one taken care of. We have our independent party under contract to go out and can review the information that was submitted by Oxpo take their own and can go out and take their own independent samples, and if it verifies that work or it does not, then you at least have the information to yeah, make, we the, have a, to make yeah. that decision. I mean, there's there's data submitted for the line in blue and the line in red. Mm -hmm. And we have a report that verified the line in red at one point, and to have that same person go and either agree or dispute with the line in blue, I think, is pretty critical now that all that information is in. So yeah. this is a question. Is the person that went out from the town that actually verified the actual wetland flag, Mm -hmm. Wasn't that a town contractor? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So why are we bringing in another fourth party? It's the same person. It's the same it's person. The same, same person. person. So basically, but I thought they did when it just went out and and did that certification again. I thought I was under that understanding they went out and verified the. Well, we're chewing up a bunch of time. Well, yeah. well, that was previously before the second line came in. Yeah, and so. before his soil data came in. So, so this is basically giving them a. So just my own naive, not knowing wetland delineation, is the water is actually at the level where um, David Haynes initially put the wetland flags. There is no water out into that wider section. I, I, I hear what you said about the cedars. I don't agree with that because the cedars are towards the wetlands and your flags are to the right of that. So. As I said, I'm not an expert, just a third party. You, I took some pictures, but it, it's one of these things that um, I think the point is to delay as long as possible so this house move doesn't happen. I will say either I'm going to do the house move or I'm going to build a modular or going to build another house back there. Whether I have a driveway or a road back there or not, I'm going to build something. So it's not going to, it's just going to hold up a matter of time and delay of what I'm going to build there. 
And as I said, I have all the permits in place that I need. So other than this approval, I this commission's approval. Except for the septic permit that was rescinded. And it's not well, been issued. It's not uh, again, we're, <laughs> it's not this commission's decision no, on that one. Well, well we, we are viewing this request for determination to verify resource area boundaries. We have to take. We all need to stay focused yeah. to this one, or else we're going to be talking about yeah. this forever. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a pretty clear set path of action mm -hmm. that hopefully, at the next meeting with isolated land subject flooding, determined by now a selected third party from the the two parties involved and agreed to, and then approved through staff, and then our reviewer reviewing the new information that came in prior to this hearing. Mm -hmm. That if all of that's in hand at the next one, there should be no reason why a determination shouldn't be issued. That and if people good. want to disagree, that's the information that's there and the information that's provided, then that's what we have. And we you have base to your decision on that. Well, we have right. to, you know, review well, we the information are. as it's given to us and then say it's either good or bad, and that's the whole point. It's the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So may go to court no matter what happens anyway. Who well, knows? I mean, that's not our gig. Well, the point is... Well, the important part is, it, whether it goes or not, is we have a process that's involved in certain standards for information and requirements for information that are there. Mm -hmm. And if... We meet those standards, and you guys make a decision based upon the information on hand. If a court wants to overturn that and do that, so be it. But you followed the process and conducted the correct analysis to do Which we that could do right here and now. I think we, okay. So I think we've heard enough for I think we know where we're going now. We all know what Kevin is. Which, which, um, Kevin, would you like to continue? Mr. Chairman, if you'd be kind enough to continue this to the next hearing date. No, we'll be back in a Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I object. You want to do that by vote, please? Okay. All in favor of uh, continuing? To the next meeting. Yeah. To the next Aye. meeting. Thank Aye. you. Aye. Any opposed? Thank okay, you, that Mr. motion Chairman. carries with Commissioner Glowacki opposed. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Um, I'm used to it. No, no. Uh -huh. Do you have any more on your box? Come on. Take care of it. I think we have it. Yeah, we always agree. All right, we're going to keep going so if everyone could take discussions out until half, that would be outstanding. Third party in the third Okay. Certificates of compliance. Tenaru Realty Trust, Tree Halbert Ave. All right, Tenaru Realty Trust, this was for the construction on an addition on an existing structure down to Tree Halbert Ave. I'll just hold it up from here if I can. It was for, from the Coastal Bank, it was for the addition on this side of the building. It was constructed in compliance, actually a pretty old order from 2000. It was constructed in compliance. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and I would recommend we get issued a certificate of compliance. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Next. Second. All right. I'll take over for you for a second. Thanks. Jump in. That's fine. I think I'm my boss. All right. I want to my boss's favorite. jeans on. <laughs> yep. 23 Bank Street. Sorry, I'll just. Yep, 23 right Bank Street. This was also for the construction of a primary and secondary dwelling and removal of some existing structures. Uh, this was also built in compliance, and I recommend it could be issued with no ongoing conditions. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That carries unanimously. All right, we don't have many orders, so I'll <laughs> okay. 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 Orders. pass them around. Um, In her to get out of here. Yeah. Is there a sheet coming around? Oh, right here. Oh, right here. Sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, I can't talk and sign at the same time. Okay, the first one we have right, I have a is 117 Madicot Road. All right, this is when we close the night. Trustee. That was for the construction of that small studio on 117 Home on Madicot Road. I don't have any conditions for it. It's, it was compliant, didn't require any waivers. It's all outside of 50 feet. There's nothing pretty really fancy with it. Damn, I just wanted to add a couple more. I know. Yeah, yeah. come back. Right. Come back in two weeks. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Write okay. them down. 
So no waivers, no changes. Move to issue as drafted. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That carries unanimously. All right. And then the other one that we close tonight, if you flip your sheet over. It is 21 Sacagawea case. Sarah, it's all yours. Yep. Oh, yes. So anybody have any? Is there... Yep, this More things on this one. Yeah, this was just for the existing maintenance of that footpath and then the, the berm. They're also doing some removal of porcelain berry, so I kind of documented what they wanted to do. Most of those conditions relate to our pretty standard invasive species conditions. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, they requested a waiver under no adverse impact and a reasonable alternative. Um, and obviously the invasive species are covered mm -hmm. by our regulations for their waiver. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Okay, if there's no changes, I would entertain a motion to issue this. Second. All, aye. <laughs> All those in favor, <laughs> say aye. <laughs> Any opposed? So that passes with uh, Dr. Steinauer uh, recused. All right, I think that's it. I think the other one was pretty clear. Cool. Okay, that's it, huh? Wow. No. Still managed to get the six thirty. Anything mm -hmm. we need to discuss on anything else? I think they're all pretty straightforward. Right? All right, you skip that one. Oh, yeah. So, if we're done with that, then we go to other business. Approval of minutes from last meeting. Page of minutes for April 1st, 2015, three quarters of the way down, the word report should be reports. What is that again? Um, on the second page, under discussion 620, um, right above that, staff, this was for spraying of, is spray, not spain of fried money, so if we could spay them, that'd be awesome. <laughs> uh, so that's, do you see where that's, yeah, if you come over here, I can. <laughs> You've got two that one of them's hilarious and the other one's just minor. <laughs> so um, so here is under proposed minutes for April first. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here is staff. This is for Spain and spraying. Spraying Spain. Spraying. Spain. Spraying. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. And so then this should be reports. Um, here we go. Is all report to be issued? All reports, reports. to be okay, issued. Just two yeah, Mr. Nara. And you said something about porch, and I thought that came out porch oh. again. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I didn't get that. P R O C H. You said it. Those are for April 1. April 1. Spraying and reports. Both minor. Okay, so do I have a motion to approve the minutes of April 1st as amended? I so moved. Second. All in favor? Um, uh, Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Is there another set in there? I'm looking. Nope. Okay. What is a long minute? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then we gotcha. go to conservation restrictions. Sorry. None? Nope. I just forgot to take it off. Reports. Uh, CPC. Um, nothing really to report. I was sworn in today, and ha or got my orientation today, and have first yeah, meeting please. on Tuesday, so I guess I'll have more for you hey. next okay. time. NP and EDC. Uh, nope. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mosquito Control Committee. <laughs> we're, we're still discussing uh, how to issue the contract um, and work with the state with the state reclamation board. So we're already in uh, the town's um, tentative contractor is already testing, and we've already got mosquito larva going to town around the whole island. And, uh, but there hasn't been any treatments yet. The town will have to treat for the first couple of treatments. Mm -hmm. Sir, can you send the, um, the product that they're using to Jeff? And yeah, yeah. Or just a matter well, I can, I can have EDCI send it to you yeah, directly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Any other committee reports? Okay. So, commissioner's comments. Anybody have any comments? 
impressive uh, vote on the um, balloon. Yes. And the uh, town meeting. I was, oh. I was really surprised. Yeah, that I was, was too, pleasantly. I think it will be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm There's a lot of interesting votes at town meeting this year. It's an interesting town meeting. Yeah. <laughs> I just had a question, Jeff. Did both of the ponds get opened? No. Sacagaw is open, uh, and Hummock gets open tomorrow. Tomorrow. Ah. So, so for all you arrowhead hunters out there, <laughs> Hummock mm -hmm. Pond. Friday and Saturday will be the day. <laughs> so, but Sacagaw was still open today, which is always good. That pond's always dicey. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. So it's that's still open, yeah. Is it making a <laughs> big difference on the groundwater? I mean, that was the highest, that's the highest I've ever seen Sacagaw. Oh, yeah. That's way high. That should be interesting. Okay. So, yeah, we're, we're keeping an eye on it. We actually installed some uh, Tide gauge and hummock today, and some tide staff and stuff that we'll be kind of keeping an eye on hummock nice. this time. So, oh, so we'll be keeping that a little bit more permanently. So, yeah. hopefully, this will be there. Finally, putting a tide gauge in full view mode. Evaluating. Our higher tides are getting higher and higher every year. Okay, Mr. Com uh, Administrator. Do I do have a couple things. I was going to mention the pond opening, any beating to it. <laughs> um, uh, on some side, on some good notes, I'll get to you first. Um, if anyone's been downtown, we started doing our drain marking project for the town. We're marking direct discharge drains that flow directly into the harbor downtown. They have a cool little uh, oval wow. seal with a little scallop in the middle. It says drains to harbor on it, so if you check those out. Um, or if you're interested in participating, you have a school group or a church group or Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, mm -hmm. just want to do it. we're trying to do it with not just our staff to try to get people involved and we're really kind of focused more on kids. Because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. something they can do. You know, stick on this, get this nasty tar glue. We give them rubber gloves so they don't get it all over themselves. <laughs> but uh, it's really, <laughs> it's really easy to do, mm -hmm. um, and it's stuff. It gives us a chance to get them some information to mm -hmm. go home and say we shouldn't do those things to <laughs> their parents. And that's great. We like to make yeah, them young cool. to yep. get them. Um, so that starts. So that's good. The other thing that I wanted to give you guys an update on um, last Saturday as well, after I finished marking some storm drains. I met with Mr. Thompson out on Fargo Way, out on his site out there where we have an open enforcement action. Um, I was been trying to catch up with him for a while, and he actually was on island and set up a time to go out there. So I met with him on site to go over the violations that we had and we talked about the discharge pipe that was there and kind of got the history behind that. And then the fence and some of those things, um, Mr. Thompson was the first to admit that he put all of those in himself. He put the fence in, he put the pipe in. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things that were there, um, I also spoke with Mr. Humphreys that Friday before after I'd scheduled that site meeting. Um, I normally don't do Saturday site meetings, but I have a special exception for this one, so I'm trying to chase him down for a while. Um, mm -hmm. That they're putting together a little bit of a narrative of what's there. I think in the meantime, um, just to keep the ball rolling on our behalf, I think at a bare minimum, as part of our enforcement, was originally to um, essentially meet with staff and kind of figure out what's going wrong. I think at a bare minimum, we need to at least order the removal of the pipe and the fence that's not in compliance first, um, have them put together their documentation, and I'm still reserving the right to call for the removal of the rest and also to deal with the fact that he's a blatant non-compliance and built something blatantly in non-compliance with his mm -hmm. permit. So um, I guess what I'm asking for is the authorization of the commission to authorize the first part of that removal, um, just to order that done. He kind of understands that that's coming. And then after we see what they put together, um, if it's still unsatisfactory, we can then just take the action just to call for its complete removal or start from there. Um, we've been more than patient with this project. So um, we did get some resolution to some of the things. Some of the other problems that were there were when they were doing some of the excavation to put the, the bottom layer of tubes in, they unearthed some of the larger stones and they just set them in front. Um, so we kind of went over those problems. I would just rather, I mean, Personally speaking, as the administrator, I'd rather just go away and be gone and then have him start from scratch. But I also want to follow our typical procedure with the two. So mm -hmm. I think if we start just to kind of keep them moving towards issues, the two blatant non-compliant issues, order those removed, 
have him document those. And he also, um, I told him he needs to put together a restoration plan to deal with the damage that was done to the abutters way in the adjacent property as part of whatever they're putting together. And my explanation to him that any anything that comes in that short of including those components um, is just going to be the total removal and failure of his project. So mm -hmm. he understands that, and I told him that this needs to be resolved before the end of May completely, mm -hmm. or it's done too. So mm -hmm. I just got tired of chasing him around, and after working on the Saturday, it was not necessarily the mm -hmm. best mood to go out there and talk to him. But um, So if that's okay, I mean, it's like the... Mm -hmm. Authorization of the board to at least start the removal process on this, and then once we see what's left, we'll condition the removal of the rest based upon what information Mr. Humphreys brings in. So, so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Because I think for me, it's something that we have so many of these structures running around right now between the North Shore and those spots that if someone does something in non compliance that act definitively to take action, I think is super important. So. Band, yeah, I was just out there. So okay. was out there. I just haven't had a chance to, to follow up on it. To forward. We have a picture that's sent around to the whole commission on that or Yes, I do now. I just okay. it got way late into a, stuff last week. Don't put that. your coats on yet. I know, don't good no. I just got <laughs> the last item. Yeah. Have other stuff, Jeff? Um no, that's it for me. Just the last item that's there. Okay, so then that takes us to the executive session or just discussion of our appeal with SBPF, our negotiations. And um, I was gone this week. I don't know that anything significant happened. No, we did. We do have George available by phone to go over that. I know you guys, you and Andy have participated in some of those settlement talks again. If you guys had questions for him, we can certainly call him. Right now. Yep, and get oh. the update. So mm. he couldn't make it down, but yeah, it didn't seem like his his uh, review that he sent out to us didn't seem anything but, new on it. Oh. Did we? Is it something we should see at this point, or? What are the points that we brought up at the last meeting? Mm -hmm. I, I think mean, nothing really has changed. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sound bad. I think it would be beneficial since last time we were talking about having him mm -hmm. come down or do it just to. Get his just, perspective yeah, on it too. To yeah. It won't take long, but you guys need to make the motion and, and then vote on it. Okay. Um, so do we, have to, do we have to keep our meeting open. You keep it open. You would. And someone then, would make a motion to go to executive session and then roll call vote. Okay. I'll make that motion. Okay. So we need to do a voice vote on this to go into executive session. Do I have a second? Aye. Okay, Mike. Aye. And Aye. Ben. Aye. David. Ernie, aye. Sarah. Aye. Ashley. Aye. Okay, so can we turn off the recording devices, please? Mm -hmm.